So good morning, everybody. If I could have your attention. So we are still loading one of the, the presentations, and that's the reason for the delay. But I would like to welcome you to the, uh, um, is this the spring? I guess it's the spring uh, <laughs> swap meeting. And we have a, a really exciting lineup. We're going to give you an update on the ongoing NCTN studies. And I will share with you some good news about two large trials that hopefully we will activate within the next few weeks. And we also have a really exciting mini symposium lineup. So we usually talk about some esoteric science, but this time around we thought that we're actually going to review the remarkable changes that are happening in radiation oncology and surgery with local regional therapy. So once we have the um, final set of presentations uploaded, then we will, we will start with this mini symposium that's about local regional therapy. And um, unfortunately, Priyanka Sharma, who is my co-chair and really had the lion's work of, of organizing the slides and the, the venue, is, is not able to join us in person. So I asked uh, Andrew Godman to help me out um, with, the, with, with the moderation. But Priyanka will be with us. And also, <clears throat> this is a hybrid meeting, so many of, of you are on the Zoom, so I welcome you as well. Do you think it's ready? Yes, sir. All right. So then um, our first speaker is, uh, is Josh, Joshua Mammon. He's a professor of surgery and the chief of the Division of Surgical Oncology in the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And he's going to talk about surgical therapies and one shoe does not fit all. Uh, thank you, Lalaus, and thank you, everyone, for uh, attending this morning and for the uh, opportunity to chat a little bit about uh, some um, themes that we're going to see as we uh, get new trials uh, focused on surgical therapy or involving surgical therapy. Um, let me briefly show my disclosures. So there are really three areas that uh, I, I wanted to have a conversation about today. One is uh, the role of surgery in situations where uh, patients have metastatic disease. Uh, the second is uh, thinking a little bit about uh, recurrent breast cancer, particularly when local treatments have already occurred, uh, including uh, radiation, and then kind of the ongoing uh, journey we're taking with regards to uh, axillary intervention. And as we know, we've been personalizing axillary intervention over the last more than a decade, uh, and where we can continue to do that personalization. So I, I, a few caveats as we uh, have this discussion. I'm intentionally vague uh, in our discussion. These are really themes. I'm not going to be mentioning any specific concepts, uh, because concepts, of course, uh, are continuing to be in development and uh, really probably not appropriate in open meeting. And particularly, uh, some of these conversations are with other, uh, about other cooperative groups' uh, efforts. Uh, and, and I want to respect their uh, development of those concepts. So really, uh, these will be kind of the broad topics rather than any specific uh, schemers or uh, protocols. Uh, and it's really to kind of uh, foster discussion and, and thinking and, and to jog our minds a little bit as we think through these topics uh, as we reflect a little bit on what's already been done uh, and perhaps what was left to be uh, done, accomplished uh, from a surgical standpoint. So we'll start off with uh, surgery uh, in the setting of uh, metastatic disease. And really, we're talking about uh, distant metastatic disease, non-regional disease. And I think we're all familiar with a few of these studies. And I, I particularly uh, recall, I believe it was in San Antonio, when uh, these two uh, studies were uh, presented. Uh, screen left there is the uh, uh, Tata uh, Hospital study from uh, India, uh, which really focused on individuals who had de novo um, metastatic uh, breast cancer. Uh, some of these individuals who received systemic therapy up front, and if they didn't progress, went on to either having lo local regional therapy or not having uh, local regional therapy. And you can see on those uh, survival curves that there is really no difference uh, from median overall survival, 19.2 uh, months versus uh, 20.5 months in their analysis. What I, th again, I think every study, even a negative study like this, has something to learn. And I think one of the kind of interesting things that uh, was uh, in this study was really they excluded large populations. Uh, in fact, they, they really excluded the two extremes of metastatic disease. They excluded individuals who had only a single site of distant metastatic disease. And they also excluded individuals who had extensive liver disease, for example, or two sites or more of visceral disease. So it was kind of interesting. Additionally, they um, in this study, uh, and this is kind of a sub unplanned sub-analysis, uh, they identify, in fact, that local regional disease perhaps had worse uh, distant metastatic-free survival than individuals who didn't have uh, local regional 
uh, therapy. Uh, so an interesting uh, finding. Uh, the second study is actually a Turkish study. It's a, a MF0701. Uh, uh, and these are, again, individuals with uh, de novo uh, metastatic disease, 274 patients. And at 36 months, they found no difference in overall survival. But when they did analysis at 40 months, they, in fact, indicated that there was a difference in overall survival, a difference between 41.6% in those who had local regional therapy versus 24.4% uh, that didn't. And in fact, they found that that benefit tended to be in individuals with hormone positive disease, individuals who are younger, so, uh, and they define younger as being less than age 55, or had a solitary uh, bone only uh, oligometastatic disease. So I, I think what we can say, we can, I, I think to try to conclude a whole lot from these studies is maybe challenging, but I think it's interesting to point out different outcomes uh, from these two studies. Uh, I, I think we also acknowledge that maybe there was some lack of clarity on some of the uh, chemotherapeutic regimens, uh, and maybe they weren't as consistent. Uh, the extent of metastatic disease wasn't consistent always in these studies. Uh, and again, on this, in these studies, only the primary site uh, was treated. The metastatic sites were not treated with anything other than systemic treatment. Another study I think that we're all familiar with was uh, a CMIC con study, this ECOG 2108 study, which was early uh, local therapy for primary site in, in novo uh, stage four uh, breast cancer. And again, you can see from these curves that there was uh, no difference in overall survival between those who had local regional therapy early versus those uh, who had it perhaps as a palliative strategy later on. All of these individuals received upfront systemic therapy uh, from anywhere from 16 uh, to 32 weeks, uh, and then they were randomized if they did not have progression uh, or, they, in fact, that they had a response. Again, a negative study, but again, something that we could learn or at least we should consider as we're designing future studies in individuals with the metastatic disease. And I think one of the uh, uh, interesting uh, fi findings in terms of the inclusion criteria, or, or at least of patients that accrued, is that the vast majority of patients had much more than oligometastatic disease. In fact, less than 20% of these individuals would have what we would consider oligometastatic disease. Uh, so again, interesting uh, and important as we consider uh, designing future studies and understanding the gap that we have uh, in our knowledge. And then finally, just in terms of our review of studies in this uh, realm is uh, this NRG uh, study, BR002, uh, which was a little bit different. Uh, when we were reviewing the earlier studies, they were really focused on ablative therapy of the primary site. This is really focused on ablative therapy of the oligometastatic site. Uh, and this was a phase two, uh, three uh, trial of standard of care with or without uh, either SBRT or uh, surgical extirpation. Uh, and, and they've defined oligometastatic disease as having four or less uh, sites that were amenable to therapy. Now, interestingly, this is not necessarily de novo disease, meaning this is not uh, at necessarily at presentation. But as you can see with the survival curves here, and I know this is a recent study and most of you are quite familiar with it, but no difference in progression-free survival or overall survival. So I, I certainly think that uh, individuals uh, with breast cancer who have metastatic disease is still an open question de novo disease uh, or recurrent uh, metastatic disease. I think that's going to be important as well as we think about how to create a trial. Also, I think that uh, grouping all breast cancer together is certainly uh, probably not uh, the strategy that will continue to be successful. I think we recognize that subtypes matter, uh, and we have to be thoughtful as we design tri uh, trials of being subtype specific and um, perhaps uh, really thinking about different strategies for different subtypes because, of course, they act differently. We know that quite well. And finally, I think uh, as we're designing trials, we need to really think about what the role of surgery is, meaning is it palliative? Is it just local control? Or is it really uh, curative in intent? Uh, and if it's curative, then is it curative uh, at all sites, or is it just really attempting cure at the primary site, which I would argue is not really cure if you're only treating one site and not all sites. Uh, and I, I think we, in general, counsel our patients that it doesn't make sense to just treat one site and not the other sites, but I think we need to design that into our trials as well. I'm going to be a little briefer in this next section because actually this is uh, probably uh, better dealt with uh, in, in our next talk, but this is about surgery in the uh, radiated breast. And we know that uh, 3 to 5 percent of women uh, with breast cancer have in-breast recurrences after breast conservation. And, and I think surgeons have long asked the question, uh, is mastectomy really necessary in all cases uh, in, the, in those situations? And, I, and the reality is, as, as surgeons, we've generally 
uh, taken some liberties uh, with uh, obligating mastectomies and done uh, a breast conservation approach in appropriately selected individuals, but that's done in a little bit of an ad hoc manner, uh, not as much based upon uh, trials. And th there's been extensive literature suggesting that we may be able to have kind of a more uh, logical approach with this. There have been numerous styles uh, that show uh, that, that this approach could work. In fact, um, as you can see here, the five-year overall survival or local control in repeat mastectomy versus partial mastectomy plus radiation had overall survival had no overall survival difference, no difference in overall survival in mastectomy versus partial mastectomy with brachytherapy, and no difference in 10-year overall survival in mastectomy versus uh, repeat breast conservation in this uh, retrospective propensity matched uh, analysis. So there have been numerous trials that have really demonstrated that this approach uh, could work. Now, as we're designing a trial in this uh, arena, and again, I think our, our radiation oncology colleagues will probably be, uh, would more likely be taking the lead because radiation is really the question, is could we, uh, what sort of radiation strategy would we have in a situation to, in a already irradiated field? But we also have to think about surgical considerations, like do we need to restage the axilla? Uh, is that relevant? How often is it likely to be successful in an already irradiated breast? with the nucleotide travel. Uh, if there's already an incision in the axilla, will we identify true uh, sentinel lymph nodes? So I, I think the trial design will be quite important, and I think we'll be hearing more about these concepts uh, in the future. And the final topic is really about reduction of uh, axillary uh, intervention. Uh, and, and I think this is, again, a journey that we've been continuing on over the last uh, decade or, or two. Uh, and I think we can all acknowledge that the therapeutic role of axillary surgery continues to be limited. I think we all understand that removing normal lymph nodes, meaning lymph nodes without metastatic disease in it, is, is not helpful. Uh, we want to remove the lymph nodes with metastatic disease, maybe. Uh, and even that's questionable, as we've seen from the Z11 study. And I think we all have seen individuals who have, uh, particularly in the past, who've had some real significant morbidities associated with axillary procedures. So understanding the need to reduce axillary intervention, I think, is, uh, is intuitive for us. Additionally, the axilla used to be incredibly important, or we thought it was incredibly important for prognostic and predictive uh, reasons. But I think we increasingly understand that there are other um, strategies to understand uh, both prognostic and predictive information, and I think uh, uh, Shane's uh, presentation uh, in a few minutes will kind of really highlight the fact that we have other ways of uh, being able to get that type of information. And, and I think uh, we, there are numerous trials, I won't go through the, all of them, uh, I'm sure you're happy to hear that, uh, talking about how we found that axillary intervention can be de-escalated. But I am going to focus on this one trial, uh, which I, I had uh, the um, opportunity to participate in when I was uh, an early faculty member, which is, of course, AXOG Z1071. Uh, and this has really pushed the envelope, and I think uh, this was really paradigm shifting. And so again, these are not just individuals who have microscopic disease, but these were individuals, as you recall, who had N1 or 2 clinical disease, who then received new adjuvant therapy and then went on to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And then all of them had an axillary dissection uh, afterwards. And in this trial, you can see that, uh, as you can see uh, in that little box at the very bottom, that we were able to get to that magical uh, less than 10% false negative rate, which was really the point of the study is to try to establish a forced false negative rate less than the threshold 10% uh, if you remove three or more uh, sentinel lymph nodes. So really allowing us to think about de-escalation of that population and really think of how we can have a paradigm shifting trial like that, uh, even in individuals who have known metastatic disease in their lymph nodes. Another development I think which is important for us as surgeons is that the reason we remove a lot of normal lymph nodes is frankly, when you're in the operating room, you can't tell the difference typically, between a normal lymph node and a lymph node with metastatic disease. And even if you knew uh, prior to surgery that some of the disease, some of the lymph nodes had metastatic disease and, and had been biopsy proven metastatic disease, sometimes it's really hard to identify those lymph nodes. You may have a clip in it, but you can't see the clip. And, and there's been numerous uh, advances in technology, like magnetic technology, radioactive technology that have allowed us to now be able to pinpoint those lymph nodes in a manner that we weren't able to previously. And that also has really opened up the opportunity for us to think about trials that are much more targeted uh, in an approach. So, uh, you know, I think a consideration for a trial is, you know, in individuals that are remain clinically node positive, seeing those who you still think there's disease in the axilla, could you remove just those lymph nodes with metastatic disease in them and leave behind the normal lymph nodes behind? Since we've already kind of established removing normal lymph nodes um, is not 
helpful. Uh, and, and there are uh, attempts to try to understand this question, and I think uh, uh, a uh, database uh, analysis approach might be part of that. And this is a, a trial uh, which I don't have any of the details, but that Dr. Singh is, uh, uh, has up and running at MD Anderson. But trials like that where we thoughtfully consider, I don't want to call it cherry picking, but targeted picking perhaps, uh, only the positive lymph nodes or metastatic lymph nodes and leaving behind the negative lymph nodes, which presumably, which have, left, le which have less morbidity, could be a, a strategy. So again, we these are broad strokes, uh, and I recognize that. But I think there are opportunities, at least in these thematic areas, and these are areas where our cooperative groups are all working, I'm thinking about metastatic disease, recurrent breast cancer, and the radiated, already operated breast, and thinking again about how to reduce axillary invention. And, and so, you know, think of that theme of that one shoe doesn't fit all. These are shoes from my home. We have five kids, so this is a limited selection of shoes. But you can imagine that jumble of shoes. Now we just have to fit, fit the fit the right shoe to the right person. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Manon. Um, so I would like to invite our, our next speaker, my IST colleague, Dr. Mina Moran. She's a professor of uh, therapeutic radiology at Yale and the chief of the uh, therapeutic radiology section. This one? Oh, which one? No, I need the pretty, okay, all right. All right, thank you guys. Um, sorry for that. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Postai and um, the SWOG Breast Committee for the invitation for being here today. Um, it's really an honor. And um, I have no conflicts, but I do want to mention that I am vice uh, chair of the NCCN Breast Panel, and I will be discussing NCCN uh, guidelines today. So. I'm going to be discussing recent advances related to radiation. And for those of you who are radiation oncologists, I apologize to you in advance. I know this is very basic and rudimentary, but for those of you who are not radiation oncologists, it's um, there's a lot of concepts that are just never taught. Um, hopefully, we can identify some of the gaps for future um, opportunities for investigation as well. So let's review conventionally fractionated versus hypofractionated whole breast radiation. Hypofractionated radiation treats the same target, which is the whole breast, using a larger daily fraction size to a total dose that's a lower dose, but radiobiologically equivalent to conventional fractionation, thereby shortening the overall treatment time. So as you can see here, you have conventional fractionation delivered in five weeks to the whole breast, and if a boost is added to the lumpectomy cavity, that brings the, the course to six or six and a half weeks. And, and this is what we've been doing with all of our patients for the last several decades. In comparison, moderately hypofractionated radiation delivers 15 to 16 uh, fractions over three weeks, which is extended to four weeks if you add a boost. Lastly, ultra-hypofractionated regimens deliver only five fractions. This is either once per day for five uh, five consecutive weeks, so it would be Monday, every Monday for five weeks, or five days Monday through Friday delivered in one week. And we haven't established how to incorporate a boost with uh, these five fraction regimens as yet. So the three trials that established moderate hypofractionation as the current standard of care were the START A and B and the Canadian trials. Each randomized patients to either conventionally fractionated 25 fractions in five weeks or various moderately hypofractionated regimens ranging from 13 to 16 fractions delivered in three weeks. And as you can see here, each of these trials demonstrated equivalent local regional control when comparing moderately hypofractionated to conventionally hypofractionated radiation. And when looking at the, the long-term effects of using a larger daily fraction size, what you see is that the moderately hypofractionated regimens were at least equivalent, if not better, in terms of the normal tissue toxicity to the breast across all three of these trials. So based on these initial studies, ASTRO put out a hypofractionated guideline in 2011, which was updated in 2018, that currently recommends 15 to 16 fractions of moderately hypofractionated whole breast radiation for all patients, regardless of age, stage, or receipt of chemotherapy when treating whole breast alone. 
So at the start of the pandemic in 2020, the two ultra-hyperfractionated trials were published. The FAST trial reported 10-year outcomes for patients over 50 after breast-conserving surgery for early-stage node-negative disease. The randomization was conventionally fractionated hypo whole breast radiation over um, five weeks or one of two once-weekly five-fraction regimens, 30 gray or 28.5 gray. The fast forward regimen only reported five year outcomes, but they had significantly broader eligibility criteria. And compared to the moderately hypofractionated 15 uh, fractions in three weeks, which was their standard, they used two different five fraction regimens, 27 gray and 26 gray, as their experimental arms. And as you can see here, again, while local relapse was not their primary endpoint for either trial, the 10-year cumulative local relapse across all three arms for the FAST was only 1.3%. However, when looking at the normal tissue toxicity, you can see that the curves are slightly diverging over time. And the 30 gray did significantly worse across all parameters and was deemed unacceptable, whereas the 28.5 gray was felt to be clinically acceptable by the investigators. Similarly, the fast forward five year outcomes were reported as less than 2% across all three arms. Again, the higher dose of 27 gray did significantly worse than the control arm, and the 26 gray was felt to be equivalent. However, it's important to note that when the 26, that the 26 grade did in fact have statistically higher rates of both edema and in duration at five years, which I've highlighted in red for you to see. So what does the NCCN say? This is um, the radiation principles section, which now looks completely different because we revised it. But in 2020, the NCCN allowed for both conventional fractionation or hypofractionation for whole breast radiation, although the 15 or 16 fraction regimen was the preferred. And then in 2021, the NCCN adopted the FAST uh, once weekly regimen of 28.5 gray delivered once per week. In 2022, with a little bit more experience, we added in a footnote allowing for the fast forward regimen, highlighting that the 26 uh, gray in five consecutive fractions would be, could be used, but that local relapse or toxicity beyond five years was not known. And this year, we further refined the verbiage for stating that the ultra-hyperfractionated regimens may be considered in selected patients over 50, particularly those in whom a boost is not intended, because we really don't know how to incorporate a boost with these patients. So moving on to partial breast radiation, or PBI, compared to conventionally fractionated radiation, with PBI, we're not only uh, shortening the amount of time, but also the volume that's being treated uh, to about two to three centimeters around the lumpectomy cavity. And while the data cohesively suggests that in selected low-risk patients, local relapse is not um, inferior to whole breast radiation, it's becoming increasingly complicated because of variations in the dosing and the variety of delivery methods that are available across the studies. Both intraluminal and brachytherapy-based delivery methods require a certain level of expertise and special equipment, and that's why it's no surprise to any of us that the uh, external beam-based PBI is the most popular method utilized by radiation oncologists. However, there are conflicting data from prospective trials using external beam-based APBI, suggesting worse toxicity associated with the, the twice-a-day regimen, particularly the 3.85 twice-a-day separated by six hours. And it may be related to radiation delivery technique or dosing. It's not clear. There are two other trials that I'm going to discuss. Uh, two other sets of trials. One is the import low in the Danish trial. The other is the Florence um, and the uh, Opal. Um, and these are just to give you an idea of the broad array of variability in what we have to uh, decide upon when discussing these options with our patients. So the import low and the Danish PBI trial both asked whether volume um, could the whole breast volume could be reduced without compromising outcomes. So patients, it was a nice clean study, uh, both of them. It randomized patients to 15 fractions to either the whole breast 
or 15 fractions to a partial breast, with the import low also having a hybrid experimental arm. And again, local regional relapse was a equivalent across all the arms of these studies. And in fact, in terms of cosmesis, the PBI arms in both of these trials um, were better, suggesting that we really may not need to be treating the whole breast in selected low-risk patients. So the once-a-day um, regimen that was first published is the external beam PBI trial from Florence. They randomized early-stage patients to conventional fractionation, 25 fractions, versus a novel um, APBI uh, regimen of five fractions of six gray that was done every other day. And it was done doing a, using a highly specified coplanar IMRT technique. Um, and the 10-year local regional outcomes across the two arms was less than 4%, which is excellent. And most importantly, the APBI was associated with significantly less acute and long-term toxicity at 10 years, as well as improved cosmesis that was based not only on physician, but also patient assessment. So this technique has the advantage of being once per day, every other day, and instead of being delivered BID with six hours apart for five consecutive days, which really is quite burdensome for the staff and for patients. So based on the totality of these data, ASTRO's initial 2009 PBI guideline was updated and expanded in 2016 with current eligibility criteria for PBI being women 50 or over with at least two millimeter margins, T1 or DCIS with low risk features, no LVSI, no invasive lobular carcinoma, and no BRCA positive patients. However, the guideline did not recommend what external beam PBI uh, techniques were preferable. So identifying this gap, we've added a section on partial breast to the NCCN guideline, not just endorsing the guideline, but specifically stating that the optimal EBRT um, PBI uh, technique and fractionation for minimizing long-term cosmesis effects has not yet been determined. We also added in a table of the variety of options that can be chosen However, you'll see that we did put in the Florence um, or the, the uh, uh, Italian study as our, our preferred regimen, and now you all know why. So in the interest of time, and not to overlap with the next talk by uh, Shane, I'm going to uh, try to keep this very limited, but I am particularly passionate about this topic because I do see a lot of patients um, that um, I offer a mission and um, struggle with this every day. So it's been unequivocally established with 10-year results, not just from CALGB 9343, but also Prime 2, which just came out with their 10-year results, that subsets of older patients with small node-negative tumors um, can reasonably omit radiation without affecting survival outcomes with endocrine therapy alone. However, we also know that local regional relapse is a cumulative thing, and if the patient lives long enough, then their local relapse risk increases over time, and most patients bet that they're going to live longer. So we also know that based on studies from radiation versus no radiation, even in the low-risk subgroups, that consistently radiation results in a statistically significant decrease in reducing local regional relapse. And so I think it's important to recognize that in these patients, it's important to look at that magnitude of difference and personalize it to the patient and not say that it, because it doesn't affect survival, it's not important. There are patients who would prefer to do radiation than endocrine therapy, and patients ask about that all the time, and there are patients who don't want to do either. So I think that's a whole discussion and an area that um, could be further explored. So the Europa trial um, is a study that is ongoing now in Europe. Um, they're randomizing patients over 70 to partial breast or endocrine therapy alone. And last night, we had a discussion about the possibility of uh, doing a study in the United States. So uh, we were talking about using T1 and 0 patients over 50, uh, 70, excuse me, uh, with oncotypes less than 18, ideally 
randomizing them to radiation, which would be dealer's choice because there are so many choices. Why limit them to just one choice um, versus endocrine therapy? Or if that's not possible, um, doing a single arm study using a short course of radiation with the primary endpoint being not just local regional relapse, but also distant disease-free uh, relapse because of the lack of endocrine therapy being delivered. So just quickly, there are three prospective single arm studies conducted in North America now completed in an active follow-up. Each of these studies identified low-risk patients using clinical pathologic and molecular uh, features such as PAM50 of the 21 uh, gene recurrence score or IHC for and has omitted radiation in patients uh, with five years of endocrine therapy alone. And of these, the Lumina trial is the only one that has reported their five-year outcomes to date, and the five-year local regional relapse was only 2.3%, suggesting really promising results. So the aforementioned um, single-arm studies have led the North American collaborative groups, as you probably all know, to design these ongoing phase three trials. The Lumina has paved the way for prime time, with the age threshold actually increased from 55 to 60. The precision uh, trial was designed into the expert trial, and the IDEA study has been developed into the DEBRA trial. Moving on to local regional relapse in previously radiated patients. Many patients experience isolated local relapse in the breast after primary breast conservation, but they have a potential for excellent long-term outcomes. And generally speaking, mastectomy with or without re-irradiation has been the standard of care for these patients for many, many years. However, there's emerging data that suggests that a repeat breast conservation procedure using APBI may be a reasonable approach in selected patients. So there are two studies that I'd like to highlight here. One is the Milan study. Um, it's a retrospective series, but I think it's important because 160 patients, that's a lot of patients, they treated with repeat breast conservation after previous whole breast. They had a five-year survival of 84%, which is not unreasonable. But what I think was noteworthy that they nicely demonstrate is that patients with the larger recurrences and with the shorter interval times to first recurrence had significantly higher risk of second recurrences, suggesting that tumor characteristics and interval to primary recurrence should be considered when considering these eligibility criteria for who should get repeat breast conservation. And the second study is the RTOG1014, which is a phase two a study of 58 patients undergoing external beam, APBI, in previously radiated uh, whole breast patients. The vast majority had tumors that were less than two centimeters, and about a third of them had pure DCIS recurrences. And the five-year uh, overall survival was excellent, 95%. Second uh, recurrences was 5% at five years, which is also excellent and they had acceptable grade three toxicity um, with the radiation. It was a um, fractionation that was novel, 1.5 gray BID for 30 fractions. So previous to this year, the NCCN recommended mastectomy for all in breast recurrences if previously radiated. But in this year's update, we've added a footnote allowing for patients selected patients who are either ineligible for or declining mastectomy to undergo a repeat breast conservation procedure with or without APBI, as long as they meet the consensus guidelines for radiation omission or for PBI. However, the a, a warning is um, added saying limited data is available. And lastly, post-mastectomy radiation. Over the last decade, the use of post-mastectomy radiation and regional nodal radiation has increased due to multiple phase three trials confirming the local regional radiation in higher risk patients not only improves local regional outcomes, but has the potential to affect distant disease outcomes. So currently, based on the aggregate of these data, the NCCN, ESMO, ASCO, and St. Gallen 
all recommend postmastectomy radiation with regional nodal radiation for all node positive patients and some node negative patients. The elevated strength of these um, uh, recommendations are based on phase three trials uh, vary, but they did use systemic therapies that were outdated on those trials, and they did not have biological subtyping at the time. So um, simultaneous improvements in systemic therapies have inadvertently resulted in decreasing local regional relapses. And so there remain a lot of unanswered questions and controversies because of the local regional relapse rates that are so low currently. Can we get away with more contemporary systemic therapy not delivering um, postmastectomy radiation or regional nodal radiation in certain subsets of these maybe intermediate risk patients? So um, another ongoing uh, trial is the uh, Taylor RT or the MA39 that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, this trial is using the 21 gene recurrence score to determine if patients over 50 with one to three positive nodes and luminal A tumors by IHC can forego regional nodal radiation after breast conserving surgery or mastectomy without compromising their outcomes. And two other trials that'll help guide post-mastectomy recommendations in intermediate risk patients, the SUPREMO trial, which is completed in active follow-up and I believe to be reported um, later this year, and the PORT trial from Korea, where I just was last week, both non-inferiority de-escalation trials looking at whether regional nodal radiation is needed in predefined intermediate risk patients who receive contemporary systemic therapy. So in summary, there are many recent advances in radiation oncology, including the shorter treatment courses and options for smaller volumes to be radiated, in addition to numerous technological advances that allow for more precise and efficacious uh, delivery. These advances have resulted in improving the therapeutic ratio of radiation. Simultaneous advances in biological subtyping and development and utilization of a whole new array of um, systemic agents has inadvertently also contributed to decreasing local relapse, so much so that we're currently seeing very few local regional relapses than ever before. So there are many opportunities for uh, future investigations with respect to radiation techniques, and these are just, again, broad strokes that I'm throwing out there. Um, we need to identify the optimal external beam partial breast uh, technique in fractionation to minimize toxicity while maintaining the efficacy for primary treatment as well as for in-breast recurrences. We need to establish how to optimally incorporate a boost with ultra-hypofractionated treatment. We need to use biological um, subtyping and develop predictive uh, assays for uh, predictive and prognostic assays to identify subgroups um, who um, might be identified as low risk, but who uh, may have RT instead of, instead of endocrine therapy. And what about um, ultra-low risk patients in whom neither radiation nor endocrine therapy is needed? And what about patients who are clinically low risk, but they have a high genomic risk um, for, es for doing some escalation uh, strategies like a boost or regional nodal radiation? And lastly, what about patients such as triple negative breast cancer patients who we know are biologically aggressive, but they present with early stage disease? Is there a role in escalating treatment for them? For example, post-mastectomy radiation in a T2N0 patient. These are all just ideas. So it's likely that what we're going to need is going to be a risk adaptive approach that refines subsets of patients that are stratified by clinical pathologic features, by their tumor biology, by novel markers that are prognostic and predictive or existing markers, and very importantly, by the receipt and compliance with contemporary systemic therapy. And that's really important because if you say patient you give a patient a prescription for endocrine therapy for five years and they don't take it, that's an important factor that will affect their, their long-term outcomes. So the, the other important point I wanna make before I end and I'm done um, is that we have to take into consideration patients' preferences and their goals for treatment. 
when making these management decisions. That's really important because as our last speaker said, outcomes are, are just because they're non-inferior doesn't mean that one size fits all. So I'm gonna end here and thank you for your attention. So it's clear to me that it looks like that our radiation oncology colony is caught up in medical oncology finally. So we have our own endless combination of drugs, pretty much probably with the same efficacy and slightly overlapping in the same processes. And now it looks like you have the same issues with the permutations of uh, doses and, and schedules of radiation oncology. So hopefully at the end of the, the three talks, we will have a few more minutes for, for discussion and questions. But I would like to invite our, our next speaker for this session, Dr. Shane Stegman, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Shane, the floor is yours. And he's going to talk about using biomarkers to guide the various local regional radiation therapies. All right. So uh, I think Mina did a fantastic job that there's been a lot of evolution in the clinical practice of breast radiotherapy, but I think most radiation oncologists would agree that we have lagged behind medical oncology and in incorporating biology into guiding personalized therapy in radiation. So um, I'm going to briefly kind of touch on a few points that Mina already um, gave a very good overview of, but um, how we use clinical pathologic risk stratification, but maybe some of the limitations of that approach and how we can do better. Um, attempts to repurpose existing genomic classifiers into the local regional therapy space, and then most of the talk will focus on development and validation of truly predictive radiotherapy uh, biomarkers, not just prognostic biomarkers, and I will focus on three specific ones that have some ample evidence in this space. Um, this is a table that I adapted from Julia White, and it just shows a number of studies that have been done really since the birth of breast conservation in the 1970s that have attempted to de-escalate adjuvant radiotherapy after breast conserving surgery. And you can see that over in the rightmost column, really all of these studies have consistently shown a significant reduction in local regional recurrence. And we routinely quote for our average patient with early stage invasive breast cancer, about a two thirds relative risk reduction in, in local regional recurrence with radiation. And Mina highlighted the CalGB9343 and PRIME2 studies. Those are studies that we routinely use on a daily basis to talk to older women who have early stage, low risk, hormone positive, HER2 negative, node negative breast cancers that maybe omitting radiation is an option. Um, it doesn't impact survival, but as she said and is reiterated here, there's a very substantial reduction in local regional recurrence, even in that lowest risk patient population. And that can be a very meaningful endpoint for these women. They don't ever want to deal with a local regional recurrence. They don't ever want to deal with any sort of, of breast cancer recurrence again. Um, and I find that most patients that I review this with, they ultimately elect to proceed with radiotherapy. So while we can and do use clinical pathologic risk stratification to help patients make informed decisions, what we truly need are predictive biomarkers in this space to tell us who will and will not benefit from radiotherapy. Um, very briefly, a couple of studies that have looked at repurposing existing genomic classifiers to help us make decisions about radiotherapy, and this is not an exhaustive list, but just four studies that have looked at Oncotype, Mamaprint, Prosigna, Indopredict, all of these do appear to identify patients who are at increased risk for local regional recurrence, and that's perhaps not surprising. We know that um, patients who are at higher risk for distant recurrence are also at higher risk for local regional recurrence, and so we see this parallel. And as I'll show later, while these, again, identify these patients who are higher risk, they're not necessarily predictive for benefit from radiotherapy, so we can do better. Um, I won't spend time on this. Mina already showed how several of these um, existing classifiers are already being used in ongoing prospective trials. Um, but what I really want to focus on is the development and validation of predictive radiotherapy biomarkers. And I've listed a number of them here. I'm going to focus on GARD, Arctic, and Polar. Um, and I'll go through each of these and kind of how we might be able to incorporate these into informed decision making for, for patients. So first is the genomic adjusted radiation dose. And this actually makes use of the one immediately above it, the radiosensitivity index. So this was um, a gene expression based 
profile that predicts intrinsic radiosensitivity. And so in this study, they used 48 cell lines across nine disease sites, making the assumption that the intrinsic mediators of radiosensitivity are shared across disease sites. They did gene expression profiling of these cell lines and then used regression analysis to correlate gene expression with what's called the SF2, and that's the surviving fraction of cells after exposure to two gray of radiation, which is a conventional radiation fraction size using gene expression, um, tissue of origin, again, this was multiple disease sites, and then incorporating P53 and RAS mutation, which are known mediators of cellular radiosensitivity, they were able to define a 10-gene panel um, radiosensitivity index. And then using that, they kind of went back to classical radiobiology, and I'm sorry for everyone who's not a radiation oncologist in the room, that top equation is what we call our linear quadratic formalism, and that's kind of the model that we use to describe radiation-induced lethality. And there are two components, alpha and beta. These are coefficients that describe the contributions of linear versus quadratic cell kill, and that just has to do with how double strand breaks are repaired after radiation. And the RSI, uh, that 10 gene radiosensitivity index, was substituted for survival fraction. And the whole point of this guard is to identify a patient specific alpha. And that's a coefficient that describes intrinsic radiosensitivity of cells. So then they were able to, across studies and across disease sites, generate patient specific intrinsic radiosensitivity markers, that's that alpha value. Um, and then incorporate other things like radiation total dose, radiation fraction size, and then this constant um, beta, which is the other component of the radiation cell kill. So promise that's the, the last equation I'll show. Um, and in GARD, they showed that in patients across disease sites who received radiotherapy, GARD was highly predictive of both time to first recurrence and overall survival. Those are panels A on the top. But in patients who didn't receive radiotherapy, they repeated this model and found that GARD really had no impact whatsoever. It didn't predict anything, saying this really is a marker of response to radiotherapy. And this is just showing that graphically that across a number of disease sites, they found that GARD was statistically significantly associated with both time to first recurrence and overall survival um, in patients who received radiotherapy. This was a study specifically in breast cancer. They used two cohorts of triple negative breast cancer patients on the top from five different institutes. Uh, and then in the bottom, um, 55 patients were treated on the total cancer care protocol at Moffitt Cancer Center and identified that by dichotomizing tumors based on their GARD score, they could identify uh, a good prognosis and poor prognosis group of patients. And then on the right is an interesting analysis. So they modeled um, the GARD score for individual patients, and then they plotted this as a function of physical radiation dose and showed that to reach that threshold of approximately 21, which they found was predictive for local regional recurrence, there was this huge range of radiation physical dose that could be administered. And what this says is maybe for some patients 30 gray is enough, maybe for some patients you actually need 70 gray to completely sterilize the tumor field. And this tells us that maybe we might be able to use GARD to adapt radiation physical dose for patients and not treat every single you know, whole breast hypofractionated patient with 40 gray and 15 fractions. But some patients need lower, some patients need higher. Um, EURTC in their recent um, State of Science and Radiation Oncology report noted that GARD is, in their view, a trial-ready biomarker that can be incorporated into trials that are looking at dose de-escalation um, across a number of disease sites. So the next two biomarkers, um, one is called ARTIC, and in this they used three cohorts of patients um, who were early stage breast cancer with very detailed annotated local regional recurrence information to uh, predict local regional recurrence. And from this, they were able to identify a panel of 27 genes. This model also incorporated age because we've known for decades and decades that that's a very powerful predictor of local regional recurrence. And then they validated this in the Swedish Breast Cancer 91 um, study. And I've listed the genes over to the right. And they found that a low Arctic score uh, demonstrated, or patients with a low Arctic score had a very pronounced benefit from adjuvant radiotherapy. It reduced recurrence by about two thirds. Patients with a high Arctic score benefited less from radiation. In their statistical analysis, this actually failed to meet statistical significance. But importantly, they showed that on interaction tests, um, Arctic was a significant predictor of benefit from radiotherapy, both on univariate analysis and on multivariate analysis, incorporating other things like subtype, grade, tumor size, and receipt of systemic therapy. Uh, they did another interesting analysis where they took a number of other predictive biomarkers that have been developed, including an oncotype-like signature and a mammoprint-like signature, 
And they did interaction tests there and showed that all of those failed to define a, a benefit from radiotherapy. Again, they do predict risk of local regional recurrence, but they appear to fail to actually demonstrate um, therapeutic benefit from radiotherapy. They also did a patterns of recurrence analysis and found that in patients with a high ARDIC score, there was a significantly increased risk of failure in the breast. There was also a significantly increased risk of local regional failure, particularly in the axilla. And I'll talk about how this might be a biomarker that could be used to guide local regional therapy in this high risk group of patients. And Mina alluded to this earlier. And then the last biomarker, this is profile for omission of local adjuvant radiation or polar. Again, use the Swedish study here, divided it into a training and validation cohort. And using patients who did not receive radiotherapy on that study, they used elastic net regression to again derive a gene expression signature um, that could identify risk of local regional recurrence in patients not treated with radiotherapy. So this is a 16 gene panel. They dichotomized it and then validated it in the um, validation cohort from the Swedish study, as well as an independent cohort from Princess Margaret. Again, they found that um, on both univariate and multivariate analysis, polar was associated with local regional recurrence in a group of patients not treated with radiotherapy. In polar low-risk patients, there did not appear to be any benefit from radiotherapy, while in polar high-risk, there was a very substantial benefit to adjuvant radiotherapy. Uh, at San Antonio this last year, this was validated in another um, breast conservation trial, the Scottish trial, and then the bottom panel there just shows um, an integrated analysis of the Swedish Princess Margaret and Scottish trials, demonstrating again that low polar patients really don't benefit from radiotherapy, whereas uh, polar high patients do. So in summary, um, clinical pathologic risk stratification is important, but I would argue that it's inadequate and we can do better than that. We have a number of studies that show that existing validated genomic classifiers like Oncotype, Mamaprint, ProSigna, they do associate with higher risk of local regional recurrence, but they don't appear to demonstrate benefit from radiotherapy. And these particular biomarkers that I've discussed, GARD, ARDIC, and POLAR, might allow us to use biology to tailor treatment for individual patients. So GARD might help us pick the right radiation dose for the right patient. Um, ARDIC may identify this group of patients who are less likely to benefit from radiation if we use a one-size-fits-all, but maybe that could identify a group of patients who would benefit from a tumor bed boost or maybe, maybe even an escalated tumor bed boost or select patients who are node negative but could benefit from regional nodal radiotherapy. And then POLAR might help us identify a low-risk group of patients where we can omit radiation not because it's going to impact survival, but actually help us identify patients who we can omit radiation because it's not going to help them, which is a much more important um, metric, I think. And uh, I, I would argue that these three biomarkers really are in a place where we could start to consider using them as integrated biomarkers for prospective trials that are looking at tailoring radiotherapy for individual patients. That's all I have. So I would like to thank all the three speakers for uh, staying on time. This is pretty remarkable to cover such a broad area, broad field, really within, within an hour. So we have five minutes for questions and answers. And I, I apologize from the people on the Zoom call. Apparently, there are technical issues because a piece of equipment went done missing an audio equipment. So I will repeat the questions to, just to make sure that, that people on Zoom will hear it. Banu? That is excellent. <laughs> I'm delighted to hear about the nuanced possible approaches to radiation, but in community practices, I still see kind of a one-size-fits-all radiation approach. And as I thought about it, it might be easier for the radiation oncologist to avoid under-treatment issues by giving everyone long-course, high-dose high treatment than to face uh, overtreatment issues because of the way, I mean, we're very aware of overtreatment possibilities with medical oncology, but maybe that hasn't caught up in radio, because I am not seeing many of the shorter course treatment options in community practices for radiation. For the just for the people who are on virtual, please announce who's asking the question and answering, please. I need to answer as well, but at least I, 
So from the available data from registry, we're kind of, you know, the registry data lags behind um, several years. So we don't have what's happened since COVID and particularly with the five fraction regimens. But that being said, I think the adoption of it from my understanding um, based on NCCN and, and other meetings is that it is being adopted at least at all the academic places. And yeah, so, so I think that, I mean, to be honest, what, and we discussed this a little bit last night as well, I think what it comes down to is, you know, there have to be a lot of changes that need to happen. And some of those include payment models and, and you know, just doing what's right for the patient and not extending treatment just because you can. Um, and making you know it correlated to one another. So unfortunately. Just to follow up on this question, so do you see large region to region variation of what sort of method radiation oncologists adopt? And is that a concern or or not? So I, I think it is both site dependent and I think it's it's dependent on a radiation oncologist comfort with these other approaches and some people just trained more they're they're more comfortable with partial breast radiation they're more comfortable with with five fraction accelerated courses I think one of the maybe benefits of, of going through the pandemic is that in some way we were forced to try these shorter regimens and we also now have reasonably good data that we can do Kind of hypo, moderately hypofractionated radiation inclusive of the regional nodes. And Astro during the pandemic even said that that should be encouraged to limit visits to the hospital. So um, I think there is variability, but I'm hopeful that people will become more comfortable with these less intensive, less burdensome treatment approaches. And I think, as Mina said, a big part of that is kind of making sure that financial incentives don't go into making that decision. So I also have a question for, for you, Dr. <clears throat> Stecklin. So what do you think is missing or what is still needed to bring these molecular assays and prediction models to the clinic that you described? Um, I think money and, and I think more interest in doing local regional therapy trials that incorporate integrated and hopefully eventually integral biomarkers. But, I mean, I'll add to that, that I think, you know, there's so many um, markers that people publish on in the literature that just look so promising. And the amount of um, effort that it takes from, for it to go from a lab to a commercially available um, test that can be used in the clinics is unbelievable. I mean, besides the millions and millions of dollars required, the collaborations that are needed, nationally and internationally um, you know there's there's just so many different things that need to happen for it to fall into place so there's a lot of challenges and and um, I think as we move along and as, as as people like Shane talk about it more I think we will you know we're making progress and I think Corey Spears um, has a, a particular interest in this as well and is working on some of these things and has written a really nice review article um, about it um, but I think but you know it, it's it's happening Hopefully it'll happen soon. So I mean, you know that these molecular assays made a real impact in, in adjuvant chemotherapy selection in breast cancer, and it's really standardized the process, it's taking away this sort of multivariate guesswork that we otherwise or previously did, trying to integrate all these various prognostic and, and patient-related information into a single prediction, which is very difficult. So it looks like that you may be heading the same direction. Yeah, I think we should all be encouraged that we are incorporating things like Oncotype in the DEBRA and MA39 trials, but I think what we have to be cautious there is that that may identify a group of patients, again, who are not going to benefit from radiation in terms of survival, but we have to step away from that as the only meaningful endpoint. And if we can develop a biomarker that's truly predictive for radiotherapy benefit, then we can give or not give radiation because we will know if it helps or doesn't help that patient. Um, yep for an endpoint that's not just survival. Thank you. So any, any other questions? I'm going to check on this other computer if anybody on, on Zoom has a question. So just so people are aware, our computers continually phase out because the Wi-Fi signal is weak. So we're in and out the entire time. So we're trying our best, but we can't control that. So that's why we're going back and forth to the computers. And you're seeing me walk over here all the time. So anything else? And, and thank you, okay. Andrew, for, for helping with this task. 
So maybe we should move on to, to our next action item, which is uh, our publication updates. I would like to invite uh, William Barlow to the podium, and he's going to share with you our recent publications, and I think you will all feel good about it once you see the results. Something oh, that happened to know where they are. <laughs> so, we went blank. So we had to switch uh, slide decks, but we are back to the main slide deck. So this is the publication update. So these are the publications since the last meeting. Uh, you've seen several of these before that were in submission or uh, impressed. And actually, the good news is that most of them are published now. In particular, our trial S1416, Dr. Sharma's trial, looking at filiparib. And the results were are published in Lancet Oncology were actually very impressive in that it, it followed exactly what we would expect to have happen, that tumors that were BRCA-like benefited from viliparib, and tumors that were not BRCA-like did not benefit from viliparib. 88.14, again, we looked at uh, a endocrine therapy index developed by Fraser Simmons, which is an index intended to look precisely at endocrine therapy benefit as opposed to what we often do, which is look at chemotherapy benefit, such as recurrence score, and showed that they're both uh, simultaneously prognostic of outcome. Uh, and relatively independent of each other that in the same model that they both show prognostic value. And that was published in Journal of Clinical Oncology. Uh, we also looked at extracellular vesicles uh, as prognostic factors. And again, it was complementary to what we saw with circulating tumor cells that they also are prognostic at the same time in, in a joint model published in JCO, Precision Oncology. Uh, we looked at thymidine kinase activity levels in serum in our metastatic trial SO226 and showed that they were prognostic. And this uh, report is really from data that was submitted to the FDA to get the, the BioVica uh, assay approved by the FDA, and that was successful. We did an image analysis-based tumor infiltrating lymphocyte measurement, uh, also using AI techniques, and shows that it can predict uh, pathological complete response, and that's been accepted. Uh, Dr. Jaxi's paper looking at radiotherapy use in instance of local and regional recurrence in patients in our responder trial and that is IMPRESS in JAMA Oncology. Also uh, from 221, looking at vitamin D insufficiency as a risk factor for peripheral neuropathy, and that's under review at Clinical Cancer Research. Uh, also looked at adherence to cancer prevention guidelines before, during, and after treatment. And SO 221, and showing that it's association with disease recurrence and mortality says it's been resubmitted actually has now been accepted by JAMA Network Oncology and uh, Shane's work on uh, combining two different markers and looking simultaneously in S9313 has been submitted to JCO um, also, I, I usually try to cover trials that include breast in the cancer control. Don Hirschman has published the results of this trial that is actually randomizing sites to different order entry systems for colonating stimulating factor. And this particular publication is about the group that was at intermediate risk for febrile neutropenia, was published in Journal of Clinical Oncology. And a companion paper looks at the low risk and high risk groups for febrile neutropenia and has been published by Dr. Ramsey and JAMA Network Open. 
And then finally, an advertisement. Uh, so for a poster by Dr. Cobain that will be at ASCO that it looks at what I previously talked about, serum and serum thiamine kinase 1 and CA15-3 simultaneously in a joint model showing that both can be prognostic for outcome at the same time in the same model. So that means that they're complementary prognostic factors. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bill. So I would like to make sure that we have uh, some time for our two wonderful patient advocates, Jeannie Mason and um, Roberta Albani, to <clears throat> give a few minutes for them to give us an update about their activities. And also, please um, remember to reach out to them and really tap into this really wonderful resource that they provide for us in terms of reaching out to patients or promoting your trial that, that may be having issues with accrual. So, um, Ginny, please go ahead, Ro Roberta. We have a few slides for you that you can move from the podium. I apologize, I'm walking very slow. Sometimes you realize as you age, you should not try to keep up with a 16-year-old granddaughter. Your body reminds you quickly. You can easily read what we have on the slides. I just want to give you a brief report of some things that's happening in, that are happening in the Patient Advocacy Committee. We're really doing an intense focus on DEII. We added a new I this year for uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and integrity. So we spent three, almost four hours on Wednesday uh, covering a huge book of information that we now have to go home and read some more on. But it is really essential that we consider those pieces when putting together trials from the very beginning and look carefully at the affected group that we're trying, a population who have the disease, so that we are really meeting that goal. Yeah. And do it early instead of when I see the triage slide and go, uh-oh, we didn't do something right. I'm excited about some new trials that are coming along. Um, but also anxious that we get this IBC and radiation trial finished. Accrual's been really slow. I'm doing my part. I remind people all the time. And the good news is I've talked to patients who are in the trial and are very excited about it. Uh, if you're not familiar with the uh, Advanced Breast Cancer Conference, it's held every two years in Lisbon. Um, I'm on the planning committee for the advocacy group as well as the consensus panel to develop new guidelines for global metastatic breast cancer treatment. I would encourage you to check it out. It's um, www.abc-lisbon.org. It's early November. Lisbon's beautiful then, and it is a fantastic conference. I had the opportunity to have Dr. Brenner come and speak to the breast cancer brain metastasis subgroup of the Metastatic Alliance. And the folks there, we have four of our members are dealing with brain metastasis. We're really excited about his research. And those are great opportunities. The area of brain metastasis and uh, leptomeningeal mets are a significant issue in, that popu in our population. And wanted to thank um, working with Dr. Jagsey on an IBC project outside of SWOG. We published a year ago um, a scale to use for diagnosing IBC, and it's in validation studies now at Dana Farber and MD Anderson. And so we're excited as the uh, data is uh, interrogated this summer and we see what kind of results we're getting in these early uses of it with the hopes of moving this out further and maybe someday even getting a diagnostic code for IBC, maybe then I could retire. <laughs> Thank you. Let me, I'll let, oh. You need to advance the slides at all. Oh, I did, should have done that. That's all right. Sorry about that. That was actually good old technology. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jeannie. So, Roberta. Good morning. Um, just as I spoke yesterday, I'm a member of the MBC Alliance and we're working on doing 
um, short webinars for uh, the symposium for Black Women Speak and Men for those um, who are affected by metastatic breast cancer to get into clinical trials. And I also will be on a panel with the Drug, Enforce, Drug Information Association that's being held next month in Boston. And on that panel, I will be speaking about DEI. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So the next part of our agenda is, uh, I, I understand this is a bit of a repetitive piece, right? So we need to go through, but I think it's important that we need to go through the um, existing trials within the, uh, well, within the um, um, NCTN community, but it looks like that we actually have a, a, another agenda item before, and that's the Translational Medicine Subcommittee update. So Alistair, if you could just give us some brief updates on the really terrific discussion that happened yesterday in, in the working group. Um, there should be a slide which, if we could put that up, which will summarize in a single slide. No, it's not there. It was loaded yeah. up this morning, so uh, if you can have a look for it, that would be great. In the meantime, we had a very dynamic, once again, translational medicine meeting yesterday. We'd like anyone that feels they want to get involved in that side of things to reach out either to myself, to Andy, or to Alicia Aranda, who is here for the first time, if you don't mind standing up. Alicia, so everyone can see what you look like. And I apologize. <laughs> Apologies to those at home who can't actually see her, but she's been really dynamic in a lot of different activities for the breast group. So thanks for putting up that slide. Specimen resources, Bill gave us a wonderful overview that a huge number of blood tissue resources still available for older breast trials, and we've started to look towards potential collaborations with Tempus, who gave us a presentation yesterday, Caris, who presented to us last year, and of course we have a long history with what is now exact sciences, who used to be genomic, genomic health. We did have three or four updates yesterday, which are real testament to the staying power of people persisting with, with projects. Don Johan has managed to do wonders with, I would call them ancient form and fixed paraffin embedded tissues, and there should be a good publication coming from that. Well done, Don. Um, Anthony Elias has persisted with trying to get funding for his androgen receptor ER signaling project on SO226 and succeeded. Congratulations on that. And Kevin Kalinsky, dynamic as ever, many things he's up to with our responder, but one of the things we wanted to flag is to try and extend the blood collection that we're trying to really highlight um, blood collection for those patients who've gone through clinical trial, our responder, and, and perhaps maybe one of the other trials shortly to try and detect late recurrences before they occur in, in the, in, by using blood analytics. And as uh, um, Dr. Barlow presented, congratulations, Corey Spears, publishing data, contemporary data from a trial that started in 19. 88. So amazing. Okay, I'll keep talking loud. I thought it was loud enough, but clearly not. Um, the key thing that we also wanted to highlight is that those four things are mostly using trials materials from way back. Now, what is happening is we're trying to compress the timelines between trials that are actually happening or just finishing and getting some translational work underway even before the trial is actually concluded. And thanks to Lyosh and others uh, and Kevin Kalinsky, there, there are a lot of that work that's going on. So you can see three trials which are much more contemporary where people like Justin Balco, Priyanka Sharma and, and colleagues and Lyosh are absolutely on it and, and really pushing forward. I hope going to give us some good data in the next 12 months on many, many, many patient samples. So the final thing to do is to just reiterate, if you want to get involved in any of this, both Andy Godwin and myself as, as co-chairs of the Translational Group would welcome you reaching out. We'd love to have other people, newer people involved. Um, Alicia Aranda, whose email is there, aaranda at swag.org, please reach out to her and we will try and get you involved and engaged. Thank you, Laj.
Thank you, Alistair and, and Andy, for the, the terrific work that you are doing by, by coordinating the translational medicine um, components. So we're going to move back to the review of the NCTM trials, which um, I just need to move back to the old slides. So this is the list of the, uh, the open CTSU trials. And um, so we'll ask each of the SWOG PIs and the, our champions to give a very brief update. So Andrew, if you are Dr. Brenner, if you are able to give us a quick update on the uh, 2007. Sorry, problems on meeting there. Uh, thank you, Laish. Uh So just a reminder, S2007 is our study of uh, sazitumab govotekin for patients with brain mets after um, radiation or surgery. Um, the intent is to enroll a total of 44 patients. Um, we are currently at, uh, are at 19 of the 44 patients. Uh, we would like to um, increase the rate of accrual and prior discussions were to decrease the minimum size of the measurable lesion um, due to the uh, uh, some of the sites uh, uncomfortableness with waiting for tumors to reach one centimeter uh, before doing something about uh, treatment uh, other than SRS. So uh, that is in progress. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then again, 43% were approved at 83 NCORP sites. Um, we have seen just the typical treatment ad, uh, related adverse events, uh, some cytopenias, um, and then uh, a few episodes of grade four ANC. Uh, one patient discontinued uh, due to uh, adverse effect after cycle three. So the upcoming amendment will allow a minimum size of five millimeters um, as long as their MRIs are done with, uh, with thin cuts of one millimeter. And then of course, change in response will be, uh, will be a little bit tighter that it requires a, a three, millimeter, three millimeter minimum decrease if the tumor is less than 10 millimeters. And I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has on my email addresses below. It would be really wonderful if you could actually complete this trial. And, and Alicia, I really appreciate your, your help with, with all the amendments and all, all the new studies. So the next step of this is really to implement these, these two amendments, which hopefully will increase the accrual. So if we're going to move on to our other open trial, the 1706. So Dr. Jackson, if you could give a brief update. Yeah, you can do it. Thanks so much. Um, I think these are the longer slides that were meant for the working group, so we don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but this, uh, we remember that we're using Olaparib as a radiation sensitizer for uh, uh, inflammatory breast cancer concurrently with standard radiation therapy, and this is the rationale for doing that. Next slide. Um, we know that we have unacceptable local control, and so that's why we're doing this. Next slide, please. Um, these are our objectives, um, focusing primarily on invasive disease-free survival with a number of secondary objectives and correlative studies that will focus on quality of life, toxicity, and uh, and, and correlative studies. Next slide, please. Um, and this is the trial design. So it's a randomization to standard radiotherapy alone versus standard radiotherapy together with uh, Olaparib at a low radiosensitizing dose of 25 milligrams BID. So our accrual, we're up to 131 patients of 300. Uh, there are months that we meet or even exceed the accrual goal of the five patients per month. Uh, but you can see the accrual is really all over the map from month to month. And we know this is a rare disease site. We're doing our very best to remind people that this trial is open. So if you have a patient, this is a really easy trial to get patients to participate in. They literally just received their regular radiation plus or minus a really low dose of a drug that probably won't hurt them and might help them. It's a, it should be a really easy trial to sell. Um, we've created videos. Um, you know, uh, Ginny has been an incredible support. Um, Komen is now going to be publicizing this trial. We're doing everything we can to grow, draw attention to it. Uh, but the accrual, because it fell during COVID, is now totally behind where it was supposed to be. And so we've been asked to do anything we can to increase accrual. So we're putting in an amendment. And the amendment will allow twice daily radiation uh, in the control arm only. So that is an amendment that will be coming through and hopefully will encourage um, some sites that prefer BID radiation. Do you, do you remember how many sites do they have this study open? It's a large number. It's 161, if I remember correctly. But that, I mean, I could be wrong. But it, it, 161 the last time I updated the slides. But Right. I mean, again, so I'm, I'm always surprised that some studies which look so simple and easy to accrue really struggle. I mean, the previous trial also, so Sositism, Abgovetica, and for brain meds, I mean, that seems to be such an obvious 
an easy to accrue study. And this also, I mean, there is only one downside other than opening it up. And, uh, I think in this case, it's that the, the, the presentation of inflammatory right? breast cancer, cancer is, in, is uncommon. So if, if people in this room can just remember it and please, like, if you see a patient, really grab them for this trial, we need them. Right, and now the eligibility criteria and the schedule also is more sort of lenient. A hub yes, and we spoke, have a question. A hub and spoke model would really, I could accrue two patients to this trial right now, but I don't have the manpower or the infrastructure to open the trial. So a plug for a hub and spoke model of clinical trials. But could you refer, could you refer to a, a nearby site? I mean that, is actually patients probably don't want to travel 250 miles to get I don't I, 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 it does it does do you have this trial open okay so just to remind you that I mean if this is an issue that where to find a study open all the active sites are actually available and listed on the clinicaltrials.gov website no. <laughs> all right so, so we're going to move on to uh, the Alliance uh, 11801 or Compass RD trial. Actually, it's, yeah, not what I have here is a different one. So, the, um, this Dr. Is Murphy. So, Dr. Murthy is our champion. And if I, you can you hear me? me? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Hi, ahead. everybody. Um, okay, thank you. So, um, this is the Compass Hartut study. Um, so, this again is our um, uh, trial for patients um, with high risk HER2 positive disease following neoadjuvant chemotherapy stage two or stage three. Um, and essentially, if they do not have a PCR, you can refer them to the study and they get randomized to receive either TDM1 um, times 14 doses or TDM1 plus to catnip times 14 doses. Um, one of the eligibility criteria to keep in mind is that um, if they are ER positive, then they must be node positive as well. Um, so this activated in uh, 2020. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, and so this just goes over. Uh, so um, these were the relatively recent protocol amendments, nothing really, really recent, but um, uh, the uh, first one um, allowed patients who received THP who did not participate in the um, uh, parent part of this protocol, who received at least two or more cycles of chemotherapy pre enrollment, and then also included patients with weak ER positive disease that also were node negative. Um, and then update number two um, the requirement for an actually lymph node dissection in patients who are node positive was removed. And then in update number three, there was some clarification uh, related to peripheral neuropathy eligibility. Next slide, please. So um, enrollment has gone relatively well. Um, about a third of the total um, target accrual has um, been accrued to date. Um, the average accrual rate has been about 25 patients per month, which has been the target. And then the trial is activated both in the US as well as Canada. Um, so some of the accrual challenges that have been noted. Next slide, please. Um, so the need for six or more cycles of chemotherapy prior to enrollment, especially for those who did not participate on the parent protocol. Um, the complexity of some of the eligibility criteria specifically relating to ER negative residual disease um, versus ER positive residual disease requiring them to be lymph node positive. Um, and then also, of course, uh, what we're, we're seeing in the clinic is just high PCR rates with um, our standard preoperative uh, chemotherapy and HER2 directed therapy. And then competing trials, including the Destiny Breast 05 study that is looking at post neoadjuvant TDXD. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a, a great trial for patients um, who are high risk, so please, I would encourage you to consider referring um, your patients for trials if they have residual disease following the allergic chemotherapy. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, 
So I'm going to go back to the slide that we just skipped. So that's the ME39 Taylor RT. Thank you. And so this is the NCIC MA39 Taylor RT trial, which is looking at regional ro nodal radiotherapy in biomarker low risk node positive and T3N0 breast cancer. Um, I will point out that the primary conclusion of the JAMA Oncology paper from uh, our analysis of Responder is actually to encourage enrollment on this trial. Um, it's about halfway there, 1,114 out of 2140 patients. You can see relatively few credits assigned to us in SWOG, um, but I think continued importance um, for this group to encourage patients to consider enrolling, uh, it's very likely that many of the medical oncologists in this group are the first people are hearing about this from, um, and then they may be enrolling with another provider. So please um, know that your efforts are, are worthwhile, and the uh, inclusion criteria were broadened in a variety of ways that are redlined there. So you can see we now allow micrometastases, T3 and 0 disease, and then of course the, the majority are these biomarker low risk uh, N1 and uh, N with N1 disease with you know one or two nodes positive. Thanks. Thank you, Reshma. So we're going to move to the Compass PCR. So these are a little bit out of. Just go back, go back. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, go back. That's it. All right. This is the Compass PCR. Uh, it's EA1181. It's a basically a, a new adjuvant uh, therapy in heteropositive disease. Those who had a four cycle of TPH. Will, uh, who have a PCR will basically just continue on the biologics only, but uh, Herceptin and Progera. And of course, if they don't, and they'll go on to a second arm of the study to be re-randomized uh, to TDM1 versus TDM1 to plus to catinib. And the good news is that um, this trial was uh, opened in 2020, and we are almost there. Uh, out of the 2156 uh, planned enrollment, we have re enrolled uh, 1946 and uh, from uh, 928 sites, and uh, of which uh, SWA contributed 107, including patients from our own sites. And uh, right now, uh, the approval rate is about uh, 400, uh, 40 patients per month, and it is expected to complete uh, in August this year. Thank you. Okay, congratulations. Mm -hmm. For so the next is uh, Tropion 03. So this is a CTP trial, but uh, we are the academic lead, and, and Dr. Bardia is the, the international PI. So Aditya, if you could give us a very brief update on this. So the study opened, and I hope it's open man at many of your sites. So Aditya, I'm not sure if you are, I don't see unfortunately from this computer whether you are on the call or not. But if you have, uh, want to give an update, then you need to uh, unmute yourself. If not, then I just give you the, the brief background. So this is kind of the replacement trial for the S1418, which was triple negative disease with residual cancer after new adjuvant chemotherapy. And this trial randomizes patients into three arms. One is a control arm, which is a sort of a physician's choice, capsidobine or capsidobine plus pembrolizumab if they receive the keynote 522 type of regimen. Um, and um, the other two arms, the experimental arms, are uh, eight cycles of dot DXD. So that's the TROP2 targeted um, uh, antibody drug conjugate from AstraZeneca, or the same ADC plus Durvalumab. So this is really an important trial because it checks whether, tests whether there is value to add the immunotherapy component um, and continue with the immunotherapy or the ADC alone is sufficient. So the, the trial uh, started in November and uh, 51 patients have been randomized so far, and it's open in, in uh, 13 different countries. So our, our next. Lyos, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. This is, this is Kathy, you? virtually, hi. Could you go back once to that slide for a second? Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone, um, speaking from the Clinical Trials Partnerships uh, as the lead scientific, um, uh, component of this trial, as Laosh uh, mentioned, uh, many of our sites are still in the process of um, uh, activating, uh, which is great. But if you see this and would still like to consider 
uh, it may not be too late, uh, please uh, send us an email and we can investigate that. Um, but um, the trial is, is pacing along in a great fashion, uh, according to uh, the timeline. Thank you. Yeah, I think Aditya, you missed your missed your chance in the limelight. So we need to move on to the the, the next um, study. But but of course, this is a really exciting trial, and it's uh, it's really probably to change practice again. Oops. So that's uh, the Debra trial. So Dr. Shamway. Yes, thank you. Um, so this is a uh, clinical trial that fits in nicely with the discussion today. Thanks so much for, uh, to Dr. Moran, Dr. Steckline, uh, and Dr. Mammon for really great discussion. Um, so we're looking at patients who are the most favorable, uh, age 50 to 72 centimeters or less, uh, who have an oncotype score less than or equal to 18, and then they're randomized to usual care with uh, endocrine therapy and radiation versus the experimental arm with endocrine therapy alone. Uh, and currently, um, accrual is coming along. We're at about 91% of projected accrual. Um, there are not very many uh, enrollments credited to SWOG at present, probably because many institutions are also uh, energy institutions. And just out of curiosity, uh, how many people here have uh, Deborah open at their institution? And how many have it open as an energy study? And how many have it open as a SWOG study? Okay. I think that probably explains why we're not credited with many enrollments, but thanks very much for your support right. of the study. So it, it looked like that it's actually open at many sites, but since we belong to multiple different groups, many of the sites open this up through the, the home institution, uh, home group, so the, it's actually registers as an energy accrual. Great. One so last thing. just for the uh, Zoom audience. Yes, thank you. One last thing I wanted to mention there is a uh, protocol amendment in the works that will allow for uh, partial breast radiation with once daily fractionation completed in five days. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Thank upcoming. you. Thanks. So the next update is about the Energy Breast 008, Dr. Connolly. Hi. So I'm just going to introduce this study was just recently opened. Um, so its activation date was March 13th. This is a phase three randomized trial of radiotherapy optimization for low risk HER2 positive breast cancer. So again, it fits the um, discussion earlier of de-escalation. Um, there are two cohorts that are eligible. In the adjuvant setting, it is for patients who are T1, node negative, surgery up front, undergoing a lumpectomy. You must receive adjuvant anti-HER2 therapy with chemo, so like a TH regimen. And then you're randomized to either Your regiment is or, a, yeah. is a. sorry. Okay. Um, it's yeah. Just the ghost in the machine. Yeah, just okay. Her two therapy with the chemo. Um, then you get randomized to either standard whole breast radiation or uh, omission of radiation and then continuation with her two therapy. In the neoadjuvant cohort, it's up to three centimeters, must be clinically node negative, undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then undergo breast conserving surgery with a sentinel lymph node or axillary lymph node dissection and be shown to be a pathologic CR in both the breast and the nodes. And then again, randomized to standard whole breast radiation or omission of radiation and continuation in both groups, continuation of um, adjuvant HER2 directed therapy. And this is now open. It's approved at 49 sites, and 126 sites are pending. So, yeah, it's wonderful. It's just opened last week, right? Yeah. Actually, about a month ago. Thank you. So the the next any study, which has been really slow to accrue, even though it's a really simple and clean, rational, the uh, Corvadillo trial to prevent cardiac toxicity in metastatic disease. So, Dr. Floyd. Yes, I'm on. Great. So if you could just give us a brief update. So that's the uh, schema. You bet. So this is uh, S1501. It's a randomized trial looking at uh, patients with metastatic breast cancer that are receiving HER2-targeted therapy that are at high risk to develop cardiac dysfunction. Um, the non-randomized arm um, is currently closed. The uh, randomized two intervention arms are the randomized uh, two arms of the trial are still open. So the study is uh, randomizing patients to Carvedilol 
or no intervention and following patients for a total of 24 months, two years uh, with echo every three months with the primary endpoint being cardiac dysfunction as uh, evaluated at the central core lab uh, via echo. Um, and there's several secondary endpoints that, uh, that we can look at um, or that we are looking at. Next slide. Um, this is our accrual. Uh, and so top left are some of the, uh, the bar graph with the sort of some of the high accruing sites. And once again, thanks to everyone for putting patients on the trial. Thanks to our patients for participating. And uh, special thanks to the high accruing sites that you can see up there. Um, I put that on to sort of highlight that, you know, sites can have very, very, very robust accrual to this trial, uh, while other sites can struggle to accrue. And it's, uh, we've put a lot of time and effort uh, into looking into why, and I can't give you a great answer as to why, unfortunately. Um, if you look at the bar or the line graph on the bottom left, um, that's sort of our progress over the last year. And, um, you know, a few updates going forward. As I said, the observation arm is closed. We did uh, uh, proceed with a Java update. Uh, part of the issue with the trial uh, is that the echoes have to be read centrally, which requires um, studies to be transmitted from the local site to Michigan. And there was a Java script um, that was, that's a part of that transmission um, de-identification process with AG MedNet. Some institutions were having troubles with firewalls in Java. So that became an issue. We've worked through that. Um, we do allow up to four lines of prior therapy. Um, the, uh, in HER2, um, one thing to think about as you look at this at your sites, patients that are HER2 low that are on uh, or starting uh, in HER2 that would be otherwise eligible do qualify for this trial. That's a population that we really didn't think about when writing this trial. And we have talked to sites that have found patients uh, that way. So that's a new patient population to think about. Uh, Dr. Ruddy is our alliance champion. Um, our neuregulin baseline analysis, we uh, ran on a few patients when we're rerunning on a broader uh, representation of our baseline uh, levels currently. And uh, we are actively recruiting sites. And obviously, accrual is slower than projected. And if it does not dramatically pick up, which it has not, we will be looking at uh, um, redesign strategies, which we've already started discussing internally. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit further within SWOG and then uh, reach out to NCI uh, regarding that. So yeah, we need more sites. We need more patients. It is a straightforward study. Um, any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the uh, S1703, which is the biomarker directed. Uh, this is monitoring. Um, Don, do you have any updates on this, or do you want to say anything about it? So this trial has been going on, but the accrual um, sort of a little bit lags behind what, what has been expected. And just going back to the design again, it's again a very, very simple idea of uh, following patients with the uh, tumor markers. And when they rise, that's the time when you do the imaging as opposed to having imaging on a regular interval. Yeah, so, um, you know, this has been slower than we would have anticipated because it's a fairly easy study to put patients on. It's um, really looking at patients with elevated tumor markers that have a drop initially in on their first line therapy and then using that to continue to follow, either continuing to follow them and not scan if their markers remain low and only get a scan if they become symptomatic or the markers rise versus usual care of every three month scanning. Um, it's, uh, there are not a lot of requirements on the study, so it's relatively easy for the sites. Uh, a number of changes were made to the protocol that have had an effect and enrollment is up slightly. Um, because this is a non-inferiority study, um, actually the uh, Dr. Unger, the statistician, thinks that the 
inferior more inferiority margin can be changed and we'll be able to decrease the sample size um, but you know it strongly encourage sites to look at this because it is you know it is really fairly easy to get patients uh, on that's great thank you so that's e1183 yeah, I think that's mine. Can you hear me? Yes. So this is an exciting study that's nearing completion. The goal here is to find uh, an imaging tool that can monitor uh, bone metastases. Um, and uh, this has been ongoing, so I'm not going to go into details too much. Um, but and we're just excited to reach the end. And there's another thing we're excited about, which is that we have a correlative uh, piece to look at an early pet and uh, to look at uh, serum bus um, that was uh, R1 funded. So what we really hope is that we're going to be done by the end of the year. We'd encourage you to en enroll in both the the additional correlative. Uh, notice that that uh, the FDG PET is covered uh, on study um, and we're trying to wrap it up so we may have more queries. Uh, but this is a, a good news, I think, for women with bone dominant breast cancer that we may have uh, another tool uh, shown in a in a nice cooperative study to uh, measure response. So we're excited that this is um, nearing accrual and we appreciate everybody's uh, participation. It's nice. So congratulations for the team for for uh, bringing this to com completion. So I would like to ask Dr. Arun to um, <clears throat> go through the T-MIST study. So it's a very large uh, screening trial. It's not working. <laughs> okay. Actually, right. you, you could come up here and you could run the, the slides from here. All right. So this is the ecoc ACRIN study. I'm the champion of it's a, a randomized prospective clinical trial in asymptomatic women between ages 45 and 75 who undergo um, a screening uh, breast imaging. Um, 129,000 uh, women are planned to be uh, recruited, and the randomization is between the breast tomosynthesis or digital mammography. Um, annual or biannual screening is allowed, and the uh, endpoint is. Uh, the diagnosis of cancer um, proven by uh, 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 biopsies. Uh, and then they will uh, compare the uh, total number of cancers um, at four and a half years after randomization for both populations. Uh, the accrual is actually going well. It's at uh, close to 85,000 as of last month. Uh, sorry, brief summary. Thank you. Thank you, Benu. So that's the uh, the Aspen trial. I'm here. Uh, yeah, thank is you. Working? Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Please give us some update. Yeah, so this is the Aspen trial, otherwise known as SWOG 2010. Um, it is an active symptom monitoring intervention to try to improve persistence in, with endocrine therapy in women, young women who are premenopausal or perimenopausal at diagnosis who have stage one through three breast cancer. So it activated at the end of Jan or the middle of January. We got our first patient on at the end of March. Um, I think the key things from the questions I've been getting are this is women have to be pre or perimenopausal at the time of breast cancer diagnosis. This can either be by self-reported menses or by estradiol and FSH concentrations. Those concentrations are not required if someone was having menses. You have to be planning ovarian suppression um, it is not for women who are just starting on tamoxifen as their only therapy because they don't have as high risk of uh, non-persistence with therapy. Um, ovarian suppression can be bilateral oophorectomy after breast cancer diagnosis. It can be GnRH agonist therapy, whatever way you want to give it, or it can be chemo-induced ovarian failure. Um, as long as the goal is to, or the intent is to put someone on ovarian suppression if their ovaries wake up again after chemotherapy. It is, you know, whatever endocrine therapy you want, tamoxin or aromatase inhibitor, it, you can enroll from between 14 days before starting endocrine therapy up to 14 days after, so it gives a little bit of leeway there. It's visits every three months. We are thinking about maybe altering that. Patient-reported outcomes every three months. And patients who are randomized to the active symptom monitoring arm 
will um, get these text messages or email or IVRS questions, very brief to answer every week. Um, initially and then every four weeks, we're trying to, we've tried to develop the study to limit the site burden as much as possible. Um, English and Spanish are available. Right now, text messaging actually isn't, but it should be back soon. And we're gonna have monthly visits with the studies um, to sort of brainstorm any issues. But the big thing is if you have this open, thank you. Please think about enrolling patients. Ask me if you have any questions. But the big, big thing is if your site has this open, you need to actually send the site staff information to us so that we can get them registered in the Procore system so you can actually get these alerts. Thank you. That's great, thank you. So we're gonna move on to what I think is the highlight of this event. So finally, we will have two large adjuvant trials that we will open literally within probably the next few days or next few weeks. So <clears throat> this is the S2212, the uh, comparison in the new adjuvant setting in triple negative disease of two regimens. So Priyanka, if you could actually walk us through this, and I hope that, that we will wholeheartedly as a group we will, will support this and, and the next trial that, that will open in the next few weeks. I think Zahi is there, so he can present. I'm available online. Yes, that, that would be great, Zahi, if you could come up here, and you can actually run the, the slides from this computer here. Thank you. So uh, we're presenting here uh, S2212, which is the SCARLET trial as a shorter anthracycline chemoimmunotherapy adapted to a pathologic response in early triple negative. And this is the study schema for this randomized non-inferiority trial. And uh, the eligibility is fairly similar to the Keynote 522 trial, which established the carboplatin paclitaxel followed by doxorubicin and cyclophosphamide as the chemoimmunotherapy regimen in this population, and that's arm A. And uh, the comparator arm, which is based on the Neopac trial that was presented at ASCO last year, which is carboplatin, docetaxel, every three weeks times six cycles, along with pembrolizumab as well, given every three weeks. So these are triple negative breast cancer, biopsy proven, uh, T2 to T4, N0, or if they have T1 to T3, T3 disease, we allow N1 to N2 disease. We're excluding T4 or node positive and inflammatory breast cancer. So again, in those populations that were also not represented in Keynote, we are not including in the trial. Uh, carboplatin can be given weekly or every three weeks, and the AC can be given dose dense or not dose dense as well to allow for basically a uh, physician choice to do that. Um, after basically the preoperative chemotherapy on either arm, surgery, uh, all patients will undergo surgery. And based on the pathologic responses, if someone has a PCR, then they would continue on pembrolizumab. Um, just to kind of note that patients who do achieve a pathologic complete response, all the regimens in the new adjuvant setting allow for six cycles of chemotherapy, so they would be eligible for the de-escalation trials, such as optimized to determine whether we need adjuvant pembrolizumab or not. And participants with residual disease, especially on the uh, arm that is anthracycline free, they are basically eligible to receive adjuvant chemotherapy, including anthracyclines based on the physician discretion, as well as capecitabine if they are deemed to be eligible for it. And patients who are germline BRCA, adjuvant olaparib as well is uh, allowed. The primary endpoint of the study is breast cancer event-free survival. And some of the secondary endpoints will be the event-free survival by TIL enrichments, the PCR and the RCB by the cohort and by TIL status. And we are also kind of con collecting PROs and QOLs on those studies being a non-inferiority. If there is basically equivalence between the arms, then that will be an important determinant of moving this regimen forward into standard practice. So again, the key inclusion criteria, I won't go over all of them again, but uh, biopsy confirmed triple negative breast cancer. Um, the 1 to 4% ERPR positive can be enrolled provided they are not planned for adjuvant endocrine therapy. Um, if there are suspicious nodes on a presentation, those should be sampled to confirm nodal disease. Bilateral breast cancer is allowed provided the pathology is the same between the two uh, breast cancers to avoid kind of muddying up the event-free survival endpoints. And the patients will be required to submit basically an HNE slide from archival pretreatment to the SWOG bank, and that's for the TIL assessment. TILs will not be required to be reported before starting on trial, so patients can actually register and start. 
details will be done kind of in batches throughout the trial. So some considerations that have come up is the carboplatin schedule. So whether to give basically weekly or every three weeks. So on ARM1, it will be allowed for both, similar to Keynote 522. So you're allowed to give carboplatin weekly or every three weeks. On ARM2, we kept the carboplatin in combination with docetaxel as every three weeks. And part of the reason for that is that if you end up giving six cycles of weekly carboplatin, then you get 18 doses of weekly carboplatin. And with that, when you cross the 12-week mark, you get into hypersensitivity reactions, and that rate can go up to over 30%. So again, kind of uh, taking kind of a note from other groups who give basically carboplatin for six cycles, we kept it every three weeks to avoid this risk of hypersensitivity and to be able to deliver safely to the patients. And where is this? Actually, we just basically, uh, this went through CTAP approval and uh, we just submitted the comments back to Central IRB yesterday. So we're anticipating activation hopefully late this month or early June. Yeah, so uh, congratulations, uh, Zahi and, and Priyanka, for, for putting this through the approval process so quickly, actually, really. So um, may I just want to clarify this, that the adjuvant component of this trial that you actually showed here is recommendation, and it's not mandated. So the, if I understand this correctly, what you actually receive after the surgery is kind of up to the physicians, but that's the recommended schedule. And patients would also be eligible for the Tropion-03 trial, right? So remember, that's for residual disease after new adjuvant chemotherapy, and they get randomized to physician choice versus um, the uh, TROP2 ADC. Is that correct? Yes, the patients can avail trials after surgery. The protocol specifically, um, specifically states that co-enrollment in Optimize is allowed since they're both through CTAP. Um, it can't, it doesn't say that enrollment and participation in other trials is disallowed, you know, especially for those with residual disease, we understand that those patients will seek uh, escalation trials um, and we'll, we'll have to collect that information. Um, our, our hope is that patients in both arms will avail these types of trials at similar rates. So uh, eventually it should not impact our statistical analysis uh, a lot. Um, and the adjuvant rec uh, therapy, the chemo is all rec uh, recommended. The protocol does state the patients should receive um, the whole year of pembrolizumab unless they're participating, let's say in the optimized trial uh, in, in setting of PCR. Yeah, it's very nice. So this is a very nice pair of, of trials, really. So may I ask how many of you will actually open it or, or would be willing to open it? Yeah, it's a countless number of hands, Priyanka, so. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your support. It's a very large trial, uh, an ambitious study, so we will need all the support uh, uh, to study this question. That's great. So the, the next trial that we hope to open again sometime in July, September, is, is a similar new adjuvant trial, but in the high-risk ER-positive space, and I would like to ask Erin to, to walk you through that. Thanks, Laos, and good morning, everybody. Um, we are very excited that this trial will be moving forward. Um, this is S2206, a randomized study of neoadjuvant immunotherapy plus chemotherapy um, versus chemo alone for the mammoprint ultra high risk group of patients with ER positive, HER2 negative, um, stage two to three breast cancer. So just wanna start out by talking a little bit about the mammoprint assay. I think we're all familiar with this and we know that this is an FDA approved uh, gene expression profiling assay incorporating 70 genes that is utilized to determine prognosis but also potential chemotherapy benefit which is the primary context in which it's used um, in general practice. And there's three risk categories that are defined um, and specifically wanna highlight that the high risk, which is principally the group that benefits from chemotherapy is actually subdivided into two categories. There's MP1, which is high risk, but then also MP2, which is considered this ultra high risk category um, defined by a score of negative 0.57 to negative one. And that is actually the score group um, that is gonna be utilized as really the integral biomarker um, for this study um, and makes patients eligible for, for randomization. 
Um, this is the background that really supports this study. Um, the ICE by 2 uh, trial really defined this subset of hormone receptor positive breast cancer patients that are MP2 that appear to be highly chemotherapy sensitive and also appear to benefit from neoadjuvant IO therapy. So you can see in all of these arms of ICE by 2, there's a significant improvement in rates of pathologic complete response for groups that received immunotherapy as a component of their neoadjuvant therapy. So our primary objective is really to test if the addition of dervalumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, um, may improve um, invasive disease-free survival in this MP2 uh, subgroup that is receiving neoadjuvant systemic therapy. Um, we also have several secondary endpoints that include pathologic complete response rate. Um, we have a robust quality of life component um, to this study um, that incorporates PROs that's led by Dr. Irene Kang. And then we also have um, a robust translational component um, with uh, biomarker assessments that's led by our TM chair, um, Dr. Justin Balco. So this is the trial schema that's now been finalized and decided upon and want to highlight that there are really two mechanisms um, by which patients can enter this trial. So you can either have standard of care mammoprint testing that is ordered, um, and if that score is MP2 on a diagnostic core biopsy, patients can actually proceed to registration and then directly to randomization. Um, for um, patients where you do not want to order the mammoprint as a standard of care test, um, there is an opportunity to actually get mammoprint testing on study. Um, patients would sign a screening consent, and then the mammoprint test is provided free of charge by Agendia, and only those patients, again, who are MP2 are eligible for randomization. We estimate that about 4,000 patients will need to be screened in total by the mammoprint assay um, in order to enroll about 960, which is our, our target accrual. Um, you can see the stratification factors there, um, age, nodal status, and intended adjuvant abemacyclib use. Um, it may also you know, soon include adjuvant ribocyclob use if there's ultimately an FDA approval for that CDK4-6 inhibitor as well. And then as we've mentioned, the randomization is to standard of care ACT chemo versus ACT chemo plus DERVA. Um, and then in the adjuvant setting, really post-surgery, um, it's all standard of care therapy, um, radiation if it is indicated, endocrine therapy, um, and then adjuvant targeted therapy is also at physician discretion. So there's no mandated adjuvant component, um, and the follow-up period is 10 years. So again, we've talked about the eligibility, so I won't um, belabor these points, but again, just highlighting those two mechanisms to enroll. You can either get mammoprint as standard of care or order it on study where it's provided free of charge. So we are testing this hypothesis, as we mentioned, that was really um, sort of generated by the ISPY2 data. Um, at present, there is not an ongoing trial in the NCTN for high-risk um, ER-positive early-stage patients. Um, we also really want to look at PATH-CR in this group, which has not yet been correlated with invasive disease-free survival, um, and this does not include an adjuvant IO component. And as Lyos mentioned, um, we anticipate that this will activate sometime between July and September of this year. So really excited to see this move forward. So I must uh, confess to you that the... Um this trial, since its inception in 2021, actually made me lose almost, almost all of my hair, and whatever is left turned white. But I'm really glad to see that it's finally materialized, and I, I really would like to thank Alicia again, Alicia Randa, and the, the SWOC team to really put in this tremendous amount of work to schedule meetings and updates and, and amendments, and of course, Agendia for agreeing to provide a testing free for the patients who don't have a commercial mama print result. So one, one more thing that I want to give you. So we are all love the idea of, of the escalation, but the escalation is not going to improve cure rates in cancer. In fact, it's inevitable that some people that we de-escalate will actually die because of it, because we, we mistakenly think that they are low risk. So <clears throat> this high risk population that we go after has about a 20% risk of recurrence in four years. So that's going to be shown by, by each and the other through the database at an ESCO meeting. But also, it's very, very similar to what Monarch E trials showed, right? So even with CDK4-6 inhibitors, which these patients could get at the end, the recurrence rate in Monarch E is about 16% at four years. So, so I hope, again, that, that we will be able to, to, to support these studies. Any questions? Have any? Can I ask two questions? Yes, please. 
On what I imagine a patient needs to be consented for the trial before you can get the mammogram print sent off through the, you know, the free mechanism. Yes, and exactly. My, and my second question then is, what kind of delay do you think that will, you know, incorporate into a woman now who's going to get neoadjuvant therapy by the time you have to see them, consent them, send them for mammogram print? What's your estimate about the time interval and the concern that may hurt accrual a little bit? Yes, this is really a very important question. And the question for those of you who may not have heard this on, on the Zoom call is the time delay that, that consenting the patient to get the mammogram print and submitting it and getting better results would, would actually incur. So this is about two or three weeks. So the mammogram print SC turnaround time from, from uh, receiving the specimen and giving back the data to you is about 10 to 14 days. So there, are, there could be delays at your site, depending on the, the, uh, how, the, how quickly the pathology process is this. But this is not really different from how any other genomic assay, like the recurrent score, could be used. So a couple of other issues that, that did come up during discussions, the validity of the MAMA print, or the recurrent score for that matter, which is not a qualifying test for this study, on core biopsies. And there is really extensive data that both of these assays can be performed very reliably on core biopsies, and in fact, probably about 20% or so of all mama print assays are done on core biopsies. And um, we expect that some of these patients and a fair number of them will come through because they had mama print as a routine testing. And those who don't should need to consent to the study and then, then the requisition form that goes to, to HMDL will mark the, the request as a clinical trial request and we will provide it free. But I would just counter, though, that the majority of the time when we decide to give neoadjuvant therapy to an ER-positive woman, we're not really waiting for an oncotype to make that decision. But why do you do that? So, you know, I think the idea behind neoadjuvant chemotherapy is that any time that chemotherapy is appropriate, neoadjuvant use of the same regimen is also appropriate. So I think historically we really treated ER-positive patients with neoadjuvant chemotherapy who had local advanced disease. But really, there is a lot more patients that we treat with adjuvant chemotherapy. In any setting where you use the adjuvant chemotherapy, you could also do it neoadjuvantly, and that's basically the, so that the, the idea. And the same way as the recurrent score or mama print guides the selection of chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting, it similarly guides in this context as well. I think the delay is probably two or three or four weeks, and I don't think that, I mean, I, I don't think that this would jeopardize outcome in any, any ways. So you probably also do uh, staging and things which also introduce additional things. But, but you are right. So this probably would delay starting the treatment, probably maybe by two weeks. And again, just to add to what Laos is saying, I mean, I think that, you know, keeping in mind that there are sometimes, you know, patients, right, I mean, we include even T2N0 in this trial as potentially being eligible. That may not be, from an anatomic perspective, the patient you would traditionally consider for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but if they are MP2, they would qualify for this trial and have the opportunity to receive immunotherapy. So I think we also need to sort of broaden our um, perspective on who may be a candidate for neoadjuvant um, therapy in the context context of this trial. And I think Laos and I also, I think we had a survey at our last meeting about whether or not people felt comfortable um, doing mammoprint as a standard of care test on a core biopsy knowing that this trial was available versus having a, a mechanism where it was free on study. And we really found that the room was kind of split 50-50. Um, so that's one of the reasons why the trial incorporates both methods to actually enter um, the trial. So it's really at the physician's discretion with, with whatever they feel comfortable with. If you think it's reasonable to order as a standard of care test, that could actually expedite your ability um, to, to understand whether or not your patient may qualify. So yeah, I mean, just to, to reiterate this, because I think this question is a really important one. So the group that we treat here is, is really not defined by anatomical stage, although we restrict it to the stage two or above, but by this mama print ultra high group. So, I mean, we are happy to distribute literature on this, but this MP2 group has a really, really poor prognosis. And the goal of this trial is to improve their prognosis by making the chemotherapy component more effective. And we think it's gonna be more effective because there are multiple arms in, in the eye spy that show that that group, which behaves almost like triple negative disease, have a significant improvement in their response to the chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy is standard of care. And we add durvalumab to it. I mean, does this, kind of answer your questions. Well, I think it's a great study. I think it's great about losing some patients. Yeah, I, I understand you, and, and we, we try to sort of mitigate this. So, 
So, um, hey, Kamali from Henry Ford. I, I don't think uh, I would worry about outcome, but I would worry about patient anxiety leading to them leaving uh, the study uh, and waiting for that period of time. So, in designing trials like that, would it be possible to allow one standard of care uh, treatment uh, while we're waiting for the uh, mama print before uh, randomizing? I mean, so may I ask you, how do you handle that same situation in the HER2 positive space or in the triple negative space? I mean, I, I, I suppose that most HER2 positive patients, if not all, with stage 2 disease get like new action uh, therapy and the same thing with Right. Negative disease. So how you do you mean handle like it? Uh, on a clinical trial or no, off so of trial? I think this clinical setting is the same as, as actually right. recommending new adjuvant chemotherapy for a HER2 positive so disease. We have, so we have the same issue with new adjuvant trials that require central testing for HER2 as we lose patients because they don't want to wait. So, so I guess the solution uh, is that you submit the core biopsy to agent as soon as you get it as routine testing. But, you know, I, mean, I think the really important point that I try to make is that you want to educate patients that there is not a shred of evidence that this would actually cause any problems. And in fact, a good plan is better than a hasty plan. That's a very simple statement that anybody can relate to. And we are not delaying their treatment by three weeks, I mean, like four, three months or two months, but by maximum probably two weeks. And during that two weeks, they will have chemotherapy teaching, they will have a port placed, they will have systemic staging, and they will have um, sort of um, prepare for starting treatment. This is Priyanka. Can I make a comment? Uh, and I, I want to uh, acknowledge the concerns that all of you have raised about, you know, the patient and physician anxiety about needing to wait to start treatment once we have told them we need to get going. Um, but I think, as as Lavish pointed out, you know, if if we really take a step back and think about it, it takes a minimum of two weeks and often three weeks to get a patient started on preoperative chemo of any sort and any subtype. The port, the education, in many situations, insurance approvals, right? The five to 10 working days is already two weeks, uh, echo um, and other things. So um, uh, the mammoprint will be back in that period of time. So if a patient's identified as eligible for preoperative chemotherapy with hormone positive disease um, to get them going on the, on the trial route will help alleviate you know uh, the time period we and at the end of it if the patient's not eligible they're still going to get standard of care chemotherapy um, so it's just a matter of kind of uh, not waiting till everything is done to to present the trial to the individual but doing it you know at the first visit where a decision for preoperative chemotherapy has already been made. And yeah. this is also a plea to our surgical colleagues. I think, you know, we're used to thinking about neoadjuvant systemic therapy for HER2 positive and triple negative disease. And oftentimes patients will meet medical oncology first. But in the context of ER positive disease, I think oftentimes they are not meeting the medical oncologist first because we think about upfront surgery more commonly for this disease group. Um, so our surgical colleagues being aware of this study and the possibility that they may be a candidate for it if they're MP2, um, I think will also really help us. So just another thought about you know, how we may kind of strategize to make sure that we're not losing ground from a timeline perspective. Just a quick comment on treatment delays. I'm really sensitive to this topic, and I just want to share with you about like two, three years ago, we published some data from MD Anderson about 5,000 patients to really evaluate whether there was an impact in uh, new adjuvant systemic chemotherapy treatment delays. And what we saw is that there was a delay, but only when the delay was greater than 60 days from diagnosis. So I understand the um, apprehension of our patients, but sometimes you know maybe this could help um, ease their anxiety. Yeah, thank you, Mariana. So I, I really think that that's very important that we actually help patients understand the, the realities of the disease and the reality is that, that a, a good plan and, and participating in a trial that pushes their chance of an 80% recurrence-free survival to 90 or 95 versus waiting three weeks because there is no evidence whatsoever that waiting three weeks or even four, right, w would actually cause any harm. Um, so there is also a couple of questions that came in through the, the, um, the Zoom. And one question was whether they could start 
uh, a GNRH analog to protect the ovaries, and yes, they could start that. So that would be considered standard of care, and it's not regulated or, or prohibited by the, by the trial. So they could get GNRH analog if that's someone wants to do. I really thank you for all these questions, because that's really the purpose of this meeting, to hear your feedback and, and discuss these, these very real issues that, that, are, that could hinder accrual. So we're going to move on to the um, um, next study that's uh, the Energy Press 009, and it's really kind of uh, was inspired by, by our expander. So, um, Gregory, would you be able to walk us through that new study? Um, and do you see Gregory on, on the Zoom? So if, if Dr. Vidal is not here, this is really an energy trial that we randomize, it's a randomized phase three study to test, isolate out whether it's the ovarian suppression or the chemotherapy that improves the survival of women with lymph node positive um, sort of low recurrence core patients that we have demonstrated in the RX Ponder trial. And um, so the, the background you are very familiar with now, there are a number of studies that show that there is something unique about younger premenopausal women. They are more sensitive to chemotherapy, even if they have a low recurrence score. And um, this is the design of the breast 009. Um, so this randomizes essentially the same population as the RX Ponder population was. So less than, than RS less than 26, 26 stage two um, or greater disease and they get randomized to ovarian function suppression plus an aromatase inhibitor. So that tests the idea that it's not the chemotherapy, but it's the ovarian suppression function of the chemo that provided the, the improvement. And the other arm is actually sort of a, a combined arm of ovarian suppression plus chemotherapy. And this is a um, study that uh, is, aims to accrue 4,000 patients. So obviously this will go on for, for quite a few years. And again, the primary objective is invasive disease-free survival between the two arms. And this is moving along the uh, approval process. And again, uh, the idea is that that's some, sometime at the end of the summer will we'll open through the, the CTSU. Any any questions or any any feedback on this? So I think that's again a very it's going to be an important trial. So the the um, next um, agenda item is to uh, get some reports and feedback on our committee liaisons. So, um, Dr. Henry, symptom control and quality of life. Yeah, I don't remember if there was a slide or not, but. Um uh, there is a slide if you just yeah. edit this one. Yeah. So these are just quick reminders. Um, in addition to the one I mentioned earlier, uh, there is SWOG 2013, also called I Check It, which is our observational study for ICI toxicity. This is enrolling. It's not really relevant for most patients with breast cancer at this time, but we may be adding on an ICI plus chemotherapy cohort, in which case it may be. So stay tuned for that. Um, 1714 is a closed trial, but it has some um, great findings that will be coming up, coming up, that's supposed to say ASCO, uh, describing findings in breast cancer specifically. Uh, we're still working on the pro-analyses for our, our expander. And the other one I just want people to be aware of is S2205, which is a cryocompression therapy for CIPN prevention study being led by Melissa Acordino. That is a limited institution um, study and hopefully that will help us identify some ways to prevent uh, neuropathy from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Oops. So I actually don't have more slides, but uh, um, Can you go back one slide uh, for the other committee updates. Yeah, so we have the list though. So Dr. Jaxi. Wonderful. Radiotherapy. 
Thank you. So uh, the radiotherapy group has really been focusing on um, some of the same themes that we heard emerge during the uh, seminar this morning about tailoring radiation treatment to the individual patients. And we've all come together in the uh, analysis of the uh, SWOG 1007 uh, trial to look at not only use of radiation, but also local regional outcomes in that. Um, we developed a radiation therapy form years ago intentionally for use uh, in that analysis, and the time has come now that we are actually going to revisit that form so that th those data can be collected across all of these trials that we're hearing about where it will ultimately be important for us also to understand patterns of care with respect to radiation treatment use and their impact on local regional outcomes. We've really tried to carpet the entire field of patients, so if you have a patient, there should be a radiation trial available for them, starting with the earliest stayed patients where you heard from Dr. Shumway about BR007 in terms of omission of radiation therapy for favorable, low-risk ER-positive patients early stage. You heard from Dr. Connolly about BR008, which is omission of radiation for patients with HER2-positive disease. And then Dr. Connolly also has a trial um, that is in development and has made it through many processes at DCP and is now going to, she's going to be submitting a U34 to do a pilot, but this is the study that you've heard about before in terms of DCIS and uh, intraoperative radiation therapy. So again, all of these things at the earlier end of the spectrum. Then as we get more advanced, we have the NCIC MA39 trial that I told you about, and that's the biologically favorable node positive patients. And then we start going into the more aggressive forms of disease. We have Corey Spears, who's been working on uh, combining uh, CDK4 six inhibition and has a trial um, in 1B uh, that will be opening in June just at three sites using ribocyclic concurrently with uh, radiation therapy in locally advanced ER positive cancer and then hopefully bringing it back to SWOG to run that trial. And then we've got our open inflammatory breast cancer trial, which is using Olaparib as a radiation sensitizer. And then we've heard um, a, a whole move towards also exploring what we can do in the setting of metastatic disease. So we're really trying to make sure there's something there for every patient. Not everything is quite ready yet, but if you have a patient, please remember the radiation therapy group is trying to make sure you have a trial too. Thanks. Thank you, Reshma. So the <clears throat> surgical committee update, um, Dr. Mammon. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if, if there's anybody else from the surgical sort of committee who uh, could step into Dr. Mammon's role here, but if she if he's not here, then then we move on. I also I'm not sure if Melinda Irvin or uh, Dr. Moore. Oh, Dr. Moore is here. So if you could uh, yeah, give I us some of Yeah, I think Melinda is traveling at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, as far as cancer survivorship studies, Justin Floyd um, mentioned the S1501, which is actively recruiting patients. And a reminder that even though it's um, looking at cardiotoxicity and HER2-directed therapy, it, you do not require to be HER2-positive to be eligible for the study if you are HER2 low and getting trastuzumab, Derek Steek, and you're also eligible. So really think about um, the study for your patients. In terms of developing concepts, we have uh, one very early on looking at sleep coaching in cancer patients. So I know um, sleep is an important issue for um, our breast cancer population, and so more to be coming on that in the future, hopefully. That's all I have. Thank you. Um, cancer care delivery. I'm not sure if Don, Dr. Hirschman is still here or not. Yeah. So then, Dr. Arun, cancer prevention. I'm going to try this microphone on the side. So we have ongoing Kathy Cruz study S1904, um, my choice study that is randomizing providers and uh, high-risk patients. Um, to, to increase chemo prevention uptake, uh, high risk defined by atypical hyperplasia or lobular carcinoma in situ. And the intervention is a standard educational material versus what we call enhanced uh, educational modules and material. Um, accrual is actually going, going fine, uh, 172 out of 200 providers, and 278 out of 415 patients um, were randomized. That's great, thank you. Dr. Lammers, the NCORP. Hello. Um, 
as the ANCOR representative, you know, really excited to see a number of these studies that are going to be opening soon. I think many of them are going to accrue really well in the community uh, for these treatment studies that are coming. Um, one thing that was mentioned yesterday at the at the meeting, Lars, I think you brought it up, was the the lung pragmatica study, which I think many in the room probably are aware. But <clears throat> the NCI is really making a push to make uh, studies a lot more uh, easy to conduct, a lot simpler. I think that the whole protocol for the pragmatica study is only about 10 pages. So I think that's something that um, you know we hope that we'll see more of in our committee here and across the, the breast trials is to try to make them as simple as possible, as kind of streamlined, as resources get really thin, especially in, in many community sites. Um, I talked yesterday with Dr. Nagarash, who I think is going to speak next, and um, we had a nice discussion about how we can work together on DEI initiatives. Uh, I'm at the Baptist Memphis site. Uh, we have a, a hospital system that serves a very diverse community. We enroll about 35% African-American patients to our clinical trials. In addition, a lot of our sites reach rural uh, patients, and the NCI is very uh, interested in reaching those patients as well. So I think there's a lot we can do as concepts come up. You know, we'd be happy to to look at those. You know, to send surveys to different sites, to to look at feasibility or you know interest amongst um, the wider NCORE community. But also, there's a group of of about 13 sites that are minority and underserved NCORES like ourselves that um, tend to um, serve very diverse communities. And you know, I think you know trying to access those communities with our our studies is of vital importance so happy to help with that early on in concept discussions um, about how we can can work that into the protocols yeah absolutely i think these are really really important points and we actually do count on the support of our ncorp members do you think it would be helpful I don't, i'm not sure how the the ncorp committee or your group actually is working but i assume you probably have some regular meetings with the sites and investigators would it be helpful mm -hmm. if uh, dr cobain and, and dr Z uh, mitri would present these two trials that we're going to open i think the triple negative studies is probably very important for especially for minority populations african-american populations where, where that's a very common disease relatively common disease among the younger women, and also the the ER positive new adjuvant trial to hear sort of a really kind of drum up support and raise the visibility. Could, could we do that? Yeah, absolutely. There's a monthly meeting um, amongst the Encore sites where uh, various new open studies or sometimes studies that have been open a while and are, are struggling with accruals are presented. So I think that's definitely an option. Um, we can look into to getting those protocols presented at that meeting. And then we have an annual meeting once a year amongst all the in-core sites where we could um, potentially do that. That's in August as well. Um, and then as a minority and underserved group, we have meetings probably every few months um, amongst ourselves. So there's lots of opportunities to try to get the word out and, and try to in increase accrual. So Dr. Mitri and Cobain, I would like to ask you to, to take up this, this really generous offer because I think that would be really good because both of these studies could have questions that, that would be good to settle in physicians' minds, like the delay of treatment or the value of new adjuvant therapy in an ER-positive disease and, and other things, carboplatin toxicity, which I think would be really good to, to educate our, our uh, colleagues about. Thank you. So, um, last but not least, um, Gayatri Nagaraja, the day updates. Hi. Hello, everybody. I'm your DEI champion. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, I look forward to partnering with all the uh, principal investigators of clinical studies um, to help achieve representativeness in your clinical trials. Um, as Dr. Lemus mentioned, you know, um, I'd l I plan to work with our NCORP sites. Um, at the individual institution levels and also with our patient advocacy groups uh, to help achieve this. Um, the, so the sooner you involve us in your study cycle, um, the you know, more helpful it would be. Um, as of now, I, uh, I plan to work with uh, Dr. Sharma and investigators on the Scarlet study. Um, so we have some plans uh, on how to achieve um, our recruitment for all the subpopulations of interest uh, in the study. Um, but I look forward to partnering with others as well. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. So we are actually doing quite well on time, and I'm um, going to make some general announcements at the end. But after I close up these slides, we, we have a, a one more trial that we would like that the champion, um, 
would like to present to you the, the Alliance 1211, but she would need to run this from her own computer, so we'll close this out and we'll, we'll let her <coughs> share the slides. But first of all, I would li I, I'd like to ask all of our, our uh, champions for presenting the, the updates, and I would like to ask you to please submit your slides in time so that we can incorporate this into this slide deck and, and don't have these glitches that sometimes happen because the slides don't come in. And I, but I really appreciate your 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 uh, sort of work on this and, and championing these other trials from the other groups. Oh, okay, but um, so um, as closing remarks, you know, I, I'd like to point out to you that the Hope Foundation, our philanthropic sort of foundation arm, is 30 years old, and it really did a tremendous sort of job in providing startup funds for young investigators and and uh, me. In, impact awards for mid-career <coughs> investigators. So um, please um, support the, uh, the HOPE Foundation because I think it, it really allows a lot of work, particularly um, for younger investigators, that we wouldn't be able to do without it. And um, I also would like to thank them for supporting our um, breast cancer dinners and, and receptions that we had yesterday and overall underwriting the, the meeting the, the uh, biannual meeting. Okay, so we're just gonna go through the, um, the uh, this sort of last announcements. Um, so we are hoping to raise $20,000 this year through the Hope Foundation. And um, the Hope Foundation has a board membership which um, tended to be a, a, a rather closed affair but, but it's becoming more open. So there is actually a, a call for nominations to the Hope Board. And I think any one of you can submit names or, or volunteer. So there is a term limit, and every year board members will, will rotate off the board, and there are opportunities for, for new people to come in and oversee the operation of the HOPE. So this is the, um, the, uh, this barcode or, um, thing that, that you need to scan in to, uh, to see the application. I also want to make an annoyance, <coughs> announcement that the, um, the adolescent to young uh, patients with cancer committee is looking for new um, members. And let me know if you are interested. I must say that I'm not sure how many people we can, or how many new members we can propose. So it may be just one, and, uh, and I, we would probably select a person who doesn't have other SWOG responsibilities so that we really spread the opportunities evenly. But if we can nominate more than one person, I will be happy to put forward um, as many names as we can possibly put forward from SWOG. That's, uh, and so the NCI really is, is trying to raise the visibility and, and in, improve the portfolio of studies for young, young adults. And, and the age bracket here is 15 to 39. And a little <coughs> sort of circle pot shows you that a fair number of, of our patients, breast cancer patients, fall into that age category, so about 15% or so of all this young adult population is breast cancer population, and we have opportunities to, to do studies there. So I really would like to thank again Alicia and the SOG team to, to make all of these studies happen, as well as Kat Gassick, who also worked on the 1206 trial, the Hope Foundation, of course, for, for making all this possible, and Courtney Willey, who, who really is the, so the engine behind setting up the annual meetings, and all of you for, for participating. And thanks for the, the vigorous feedback and debate. I, I really think that's, that's the purpose of the meeting. So I'm gonna, um, so, I'll, I'll, yeah. So if you could go ahead and, and you can actually put up your slides about the update on, on E11, sorry, uh, E1211. Are you guys able to see the slides? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Are you able to see the slides? Yeah, we, we see the slides. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I apologize. I'm not certain how it got uh, lost in, in the slide deck that I was just contacted a week ago to present these uh, on behalf of Dr. Jassine. So I'm uh, Carla Sepulveda. I'm the director of breast imaging at Baylor College of Medicine. And I'm also the SWOG imaging champion for EA1211, the direct trial. This is a primary imaging trial that is designed to test the role of FDG PET to predict response to therapy prior to surgery for HER2 positive breast cancer. 
and in a we are very excited. The trial actually just opened uh, two days ago. Let's see if it'll let me advance here. Okay, so as background, everyone is aware of the HER2 therapy revolution we have witnessed with current neoadjuvant regimens for HER2 positive breast cancer. What is not as well delineated is how we can use predictive imaging biomarkers to help us identify patients who are likely or not to have a path CR and how we can use that information to help optimize therapy and minimize therapy toxicity for the patient. FDG PET-CT is a promising biomarker to predict pathologic complete response. And uh, what's particularly exciting about PET-CT is that it's as early as two weeks after starting both chemotherapy and HER2 targeted therapy alone in HER2 breast cancer. You can see several of the trials there that have looked at it. However, these trials have included heterogeneous treatment regimens and ER status. Only TBCRC026 was designed to identify optimal PET threshold. So if we can just take a moment and look at the schema here, uh, you can see the eligibility criteria on the left here. Our target accrual is 235 patients. Once the patient is registered, uh, there will be a baseline FDG PET CT. Uh, it must be on an Akron qualified scanner. If the patient had their baseline PET CT at an outside facility, they are still eligible, um, but it, it also has to be an Akron qualified scanner. In addition, if M1 disease is detected at this baseline FDG PET CT, uh, the patient will be off trial. The patient will then start the pertuzumab-based neoadjuvant therapy. And you can see down here, the patients will undergo one of two standard of care pertuzumab-based regimens, either the THP or the TCHP. Uh, Anthracycline-based therapy is not permitted as part of the initial regimen. Once the therapy is started, on day 15 up to day 22, uh, a T1, the the next FDG uh, PET CD will be performed. This is, as you know, not a standard of care uh, scan and will actually not be interpreted on site. It will be uh, the quantitative assessments uh, will be done centrally and there actually won't be a report for the physician or patient from this scan. There will just be a safety check for any kind of urgent findings locally. Then uh, the place, uh, patient will complete neoadjuvant therapy and surgery to assess complete response, and then standard adjuvant therapy and follow-up. Uh, the primary objective is to estimate the negative predictive value of FDG PET-CT for PATH-CR. If validated, the data will be used to design clinical utility studies using FDG PET-CT as an integral biomarker for adapting therapy. So at this uh, step here, what they're looking at is uh, the change in the SUL max. Um, and then where we envision this is uh, because the negative predictive value, if that change in SUL max is less than 40%, um, which has been found to be not associated with pass -CR, then we can imagine that those uh, patients could then be um, escalated in their treatment. This is additional information on uh, contacts. And this is the physician champions. Um, in terms of conflicting studies, um, the, the only other trial uh, that we see as a potential as a conflict is what as the EA1181, the Compass HER2 PCR, which we discussed earlier, as was discussed, they have had robust accrual and it's estimated to close in August. Um, so in the meantime, this these two states have very similar patient profiles. So we are encouraging co-enrollment for both trials for those patients. Appreciate the time, thank you. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Carla, and, and uh, thanks for, for um sort of reminding us to, to review this. So I have a question. So 
Um, how do you know that the PET CT is more accurate than, than a, an MRI, or is there any concern about two PET CTs back to back, which probably would be the equivalent radiation to six CT scans of the chest within two weeks? Yeah, you know this. So, for full disclosure, I am not a nuclear medicine physician. I am a breast imager that reads MRIs, mammograms, and ultrasounds. And that was my immediate response when I was looking at this: is why are we doing with this with MRI? You know, it seems to fit more into the sort of workflow. So there were a couple reasons um, that Dr. Jasine outlined. Um, one was related to um, the early, the PET CT shows the change sooner. The iSpy2 data showed that the association of change and functional tumor volume on MRI was documented uh, documented at later time points. Uh, so I think her it, when it was associated with PCR. So I think her intention here is to have that window sooner in the therapy. A journey for the patient to to modify the the treatment if needed. She also included in the protocol a statement about how uh, glucose me metabolism is downstream from her two metabolism. So there was sort of an association with that. But absolutely, I, I you know I I do think just in terms of workflow um, that that a very similar study looking at MRI would would make sense as well. Great, thank you. So this is gonna conclude our, our uh, meeting and I would like to thank our audiovisual um, team here also to try to fix the, the glitches <coughs> in the, the system. Uh, I'm not sure that we always succeeded, but I think they did the best, so thank you.